I saw this fantastic documentary Vendetta Truth, Lies and the Mafia on Netflix playing in Sicily the island in the south of Italy and not far from Egypt and its pharaohs therefore the very powerful kingdom of the two Sicilies for whom the Mafia are their mercenaries in order to hold the people squeezed into the bench vice with on one side the Mafia Templars and on the other side the Freemason nobility authorities which gets so visible seeing this documentary about the brave Sicilian Pino Magnacci and his small personal Telegiato radio fighting for the Sicilian people against this terrible enemy called the Mafia in fact in Italian the name Magnacci it means the maniac <laughs> Well, he sort of is, I suppose, in a good way. And as he, Pino Magnacci, had such a tremendous success fighting the Sicilian Mafia, in spite of the immense dangers for him, for his family, his pets and his belongings, the equally aristocratic authorities in the name of Judge Silvana Saguto came to help the Mafia and started to attack the good man so he couldn't work anymore as he had to defend himself from the aristocratic Mafia of the Italian Justice Department in the name of Judge Silvana Saguto. Silvana Saguto has written high nobility all over her face and showing it by the way she closes herself and gives secret symbols through her necklaces and other Look here, here's got the seal of Solomon, a king, a jaywalker king, a pharaoh. Here's a lot of circles for the compass and here are the squares. So it's saying square and compass all over with a lot of circles here. There are three big ones for the concept of three and one small. So for the concept of four, this is like a swastika which comes from the pharaohs, which I explain in my videos. Here in her living room probably you see the symbol of the French Republic, the New World Order, the Arc de Triomphe, Arc, it comes from Arcos meaning to rule and it's got all these classic buildings, Greek Roman buildings out of Pharaoh. I mean, I mean look at her, this is, this is the nobility. So here you can see the crest or coat of arms of the um, the kingdom of the two Sicilies and here this is the upper degrees of the Scottish Rite they have this symbol the 28th, 29th, 30th uh, until 33 they have this symbol for their degree here you see a square yeah, here's a circle, it says square and compass, a lot of Templar crosses here and um, so the, this is the house of Bourbon and uh, the two Sicilies yeah, the house of Bourbon, two Sicilies so she, the judge Silvana Saguto is most likely from the extremely powerful royal house of Bourbon 
and the two Sicilies, and in order for Pharaoh's nobility to parasite on the people, she used the Mafia as a pretext to issue the very controversial so-called preventive measures based upon the lie to confiscate Mafia belongings and freeze their bank accounts. But instead, the nobility authorities started to pillage honest, hard-working Italians and confiscate their life's work straight into the hands of Italy's nobility through a complex nepotist Freemason network of all the initiated working in the Palermo Justice Department. So here you see the logo of the um, Anti-Mafia Police Direzione Investigativa Anti-Mafia. So it starts with a D, which you can find here, that this is supposed to be a D, which you say so. The I is here, well, maybe. And here the A is here. But why do it in this way? I mean, who can recognize there's a DIA except them? Well, here's the square. This is exactly 90 degrees. Interesting, the point, it comes here like, well, okay. The whole thing is in a circle for the compass, and this is the square. So they see it immediately. It says square and compass. And then the A, it looks also like the compass, you know, and it's 60 degrees probably. And here is a, a um, pentagram like the Pentagon, you know, it's, it's always, you know, getting to the same stuff. That's why the Pentagon is, you know, it's like in a pentagram. And behind it, you can hardly see it, is the Lions Club rotary symbol of these Freemasons always giving, you know, so-called, you know, philanthropist, uh, you know, helping some schools for children, you know, so they have a better access on them. And the whole thing here is in a uh, oval, like the Oval Office. And it says, Vis Unita Fortior. It means together we are stronger or something like this, well, which is typical, typical Templar stuff, you know, like uh, Uno pro omnibus, omnes pro uno, one for all, uh, all for one, or the uh, the Trump said it as well. So he's saying exactly the same. Yeah, in the Oval Office here, he said the same thing, like vis unita fortior, like where we go one, we go all. Same thing. And this is sort of light blue, and then here, behind it is white. Now, why do they have to accentuate the V? All of a sudden, by having the other another color on the other side, so they all see it. Oh, well, because this is the Templar V, like the V for victory. You know, like Churchill did it. You know, the child murderer who helped murdering twenty-three thousand uh, children in uh, South Africa. And uh, this is probably um, Acacia, or this one here. Uh, here it says Repubblica Italiana. Even in the flag is the concept of three because that's them. It's the nobility. And, we are, and this is us, you know, the concept of four, the gap in between all this. You know, so we spread our legs, you know, and they can rape us. You know, that's what it probably all means. And even this state corruption got all figured out by this smart Pino Maniacci and his tiny, but in the meantime, very popular Teligiato radio, literally raided by the Sicilians seeking for help, being taken hostage in between the Templars Mafia and the nobility 
authorities. Only not even the Sicilians know who the Mafia actually really are and where they originally come from. So on top here there's the boss called the Don, like uh, Don Corleone, you know the famous one. The word Don, also like in Spanish Don Quixote, it comes from the Hebrew word Adonai, but of course um, it's the um, the Pharaonic branch, like uh, King Solomon, also a Don, of course, an Adonai or a king, the Lord Don. It means like a Lord, like uh, the Freemasons in a. Um, <clears throat> in in a way talking bad about Christ they call him uh, Adonai as well so then they got the uh, consigliere or consiglieri in Italian uh, it's like in a chess game like the bishop um, and the underboss the capo the soldiers and here you got the asso associates and above this there's even more uh, which I will tell you in a minute so you got the family links here these are the family links and you got the indirect links like these ones here They're even a consigliere and uh, for the crusaders and the Templar masters on the way to Jerusalem, Sicily became the most important bridgehead for the Knights Templars, with commanderies all over this huge island in the Mediterranean, in between Europe and Jerusalem. Like the Sicilian Templar commanderies of Saint Nicholas or San Niccolo del Tempio in Italian, in Bulgarano near Scordia in Catania province, the Templar Church of Saint Mary Carmina or Chiesa del Carmine in Italian, in Piazza Armerina, the Templar commanderies of Calta Girona, Trapani, Siracusa, Butera and Lantini. So here you can see it here. Ardana, Maltana, Caltagirone, Piazza, Aidone, Muro, Paterno, Messina, Magrentino, San Leonardo, Bulgarano, Pantal Pantalica, the whole Templar commanderies and there are many more. Um, I think this one here is a there are also many commanderies of the uh, of the Teutonic Knights, and here, exactly here, in Kafalu, um, Alistair Crowley he had his temple here, and um, exactly here was a a a commandery of the Teutonic Knights. I will tell you more about it later. And of course, Alistair Crowley, he spent all his time, a lot of time in Germany and in Switzerland, you know, where the Teutonic Knights actually came from. The most important Sicilian Templar commanderies of Messina, Marsala and Trapani served the order as a major stopover for Crusaders and pilgrims en route to the Holy Land by sea. Now this here is the crest of Sicily. Kind of weird, eh? Anyway, there are three legs, so it's the concept of three, which is them, our masters. And each one of these is like 60 degrees for the compass. Um, And so, 
it's in French so I could only find it in French there's a lot of stuff you know you can only find either in German or in French and it's not in Italian uh, English so here's some more Templar commanderies uh, Etablissement in Aidone, Ardane, Maltane, Bulgarano, Caltagirone, Magrentino, Siracusa. Uh, these are the towns next to it. So this Magrentino is next to Siracusa. There you go. And Caltagirone is here next to Piazza. And Caltagirone, Bulgarano is next to Scordia. Ardan is next to Butera, Aidone, and there we go. The commandery of Messina is next is in Messina. In Muro it's here and here. The one in Patalica is here. And this one is here. And this one, Paterno, is in Paterno. And yeah, Piazza Armenia, uh, Armarina, sorry. And here, Francofonte, Lentini. And here was this picture here. So. You know, I would not be surprised at all when the Mafia families are centered in towns around these Templar commanderies. So maybe some Sicilian or Italian can confirm me this. So maybe Pino Maniacci or a friend of his can find this out for me because it's very very important because it's all one and the same thing nobility mafia authorities the um, um, and the um, um, Alistair Crowley satanic stuff nobility pharaohs it's it, it all it's all the same stuff people armies police it's all the same stuff so it's very important somebody find it out for me where exactly are the big mafia towns it, it, it was said in the video but I don't want to go and look at it again and uh, it's already a lot of work what I'm doing here nowhere else in the entire world you find so many mafiosi mobsters as in Sicily, the birthplace of the Mafia. And nowhere else in the entire world you find such a density on Knights Templar commanderies. And both are multinationals making a lot of money. Both are military organized with a strict hierarchy. Both work in secret, in the dark, with a code of silence, the Omerta. Both kill people without remorse and both pretend to believe in Jesus Christ. You think this is just a coincidence without any connection between the Templar mobsters and the Mafia mobsters. Or did it never even cross your mind at all? So here you see the Teutonic Knight. Here it says, Kommt to Reihen und Burgen des Deutschen Ordens, ca. 1300. So here is uh, Sicily. And this Teutonic Knight's commandery is at Cephalu, where Alistair Crowley had his... Uh, the temple of Thelema doing his very bad things and this is the typical the Baltic where the Teutonic Knights where they had another 200 years of Crusades after the Crusades starting in 1291 when they founded Switzerland here this is this is the same as the Templars only 
The Templars started about here in France, where the, where the dot is. They got kicked out of France, they went to Switzerland, they changed the language, and then they went here. And this is also where the president of Russia, Putin, where he's from. From uh, St. Petersburg, somewhere here. And this is why he speaks German. Right? And this, well, this is why the Germans, they like him. And... Uh, you know, like Russia today, the, the, that's the, that's for the German people. This is that's the only honest TV. You know, mainstream media. That's the only honest one for them. The rest is the Lügenpresse. Well, it has all to do with the Teutonic Knights. You know, and they were here. So you see, on the left side of the island, Teutonic Knights here. On the east side, as I've shown you before, Templars. You know, and then here's Jerusalem. But they went straight here over where there's another Templar commandery, which I'm going to show you right now. So they, they went here. They came from Northern Europe, the Crusaders, and then here. They went straight here and on horseback, or they walked to Jerusalem. And... Uh, most of all Egypt of course to get the Templars treasure out of the pyramids yeah, you see here's the kingdom of Sicily here's Malta the, the Maltese Knights the Maltese Order and here's Tripoli and now in Libya uh, they are the territories of the Knights Hospitallers yeah. and before that because you know the Knights Templars they went they went over into the hospitalers when they got forbidden. So here was a Templar's commandery. So they went from here to here, and then they went to Jerusalem. And saying, Hallelujah, we killed another 10,000 people. Why do you think Alistair Crowley, the big royal Satanist pinklist killer, felt so safe in Sicily? Huh? A place where the rest of the world wouldn't feel safe at all. Where in Cephalou, Sicily, he even sacrificed his own child called Poupé. He had together with the Swiss Lea Hirsik in his satanic temple of Thilima, with many children disappearing all over Sicily every time he visited Sicily and the temple. Crowley and the Swiss Hirsik, a typical Swiss surname, had a child together whom they called Poupé, meaning a doll in French, whom they sacrificed in their Sicilian temple before she even got one year old. Of course, Crowley spent a lot of time in Switzar land, the land of Sar, and base of it all, which you can read here. So, here it says, she was a Swiss American. No, well, she was Swiss. She was, you know, look, she was born in, uh, in Switzerland, in Traxelwald, the canton of Bern, the same area where I was in. And I tell you, this is evil. You can, it, it's evil all over in Switzerland. So she was born in Switzerland and then she moved to the United States, uh, when she was two years old. Yeah, okay. And of course, together with her parents, taking it all, all the evil with her from Switzerland. Well, you can read it yourself. Yeah, this is in Cephalou. There it is. The Abbey, Abbey of uh, Thelema. It says, in a, uh, in a small house which was used as a temple and spiritual center founded by Elister Crowley and Lea Hirsik in Cephalou. So this is, you know, the Swiss, they just emigrate to the United States. They bring their evil with, with them. And then they, um, they take over the, um, 
they, they take over America. They, they go to all key positions. And, um, uh, yeah, here it says, With Crowley, Leah had a daughter whom they named Anna Leah Poupé, the surname Poupé, Crowley. And she was born on January 26th, 1920, in Fontainebleau. You know, that's where the uh, the French kings uh, lived, Fontainebleau. It's very, uh, the elite is there, you know. That's probably the Swiss. She took him there. You know. So I'd say, you know, it's not um, Alistair Crowley, the big Satanist, you know, it's the Swiss behind it. Um, this one here, the um, Hirsik woman. And she died in 1975 in Switzerland, the age 91. This is the real powers behind it, you know, and then they, they just accentuate it on somebody else. It's also the Canton of Bern, uh, Switzerland. Um, next to Interlaken, also where a lot of Americans are going, you know. Tourists, a lot of Japs, a lot of Russians, Leah Hirsik, Swiss American. You know? Swiss Americans are Americans of Swiss descent, and as I already told you, there are one million in the US, one million people, and they rule the US. You know, with presidents like Obama, like uh, Herbert Hoover, the director of the CIA, J. Edgar Hoover, of Swiss name Hoover, they rule the US, no, no doubt. So this here is Cefalu in Italy, where Alistair Crowley and the Swiss, Hirsik, Lea Hirsik, where they... Um, where they had the temple where they sacrificed people. A lot of people died there. So, and I wonder if some Italians can tell me, or some Sicilians, if this is a stronghold here of the Mafia, Cefalu. I know, which I've shown you just before, that uh, the, the uh, Teutonic Knights, they had a commandery there. And the Teutonic Knights are the German-speaking uh, Templars. They come out of the Templars when the Templars disappeared. You see, they got in their coat of arms, they got a crown in there. The concept of three with a circle, which is also the concept of three, which is them. The concept of three is them here, the crown. You know? It's the same. So, well, you, if you want to read it, you can put there's nothing in it. So here's Cephalua, just showed that to you before. That's where you had the um, the Thelema temple killing a lot of people. So, I mean, nobody would safe, feel safe, especially in those days in Sicily. But this guy felt very safe, you know. So that means, you know, he was part of it all, you know. And I mean, it's again the Swiss connection. It's every time, every time, Switzerland. Eh? Well, the mafia, they put their money on a Swiss bank, you know. It, it's the head office of the Knights Templars and, the, and all the banks. They come out of the Templars. They invented banking, you know. They, they founded the banks. So, of course, you know, with this Swiss connection, you know, you could feel safe there. And I tell you once again, it's not uh, Alistair Crowley, the big man behind all the Satanist things, you know. Not at all. It's the Swiss. It's Lea Hirsig, the canton of Bern, where I lived as well. It's is extremely evil. Especially if you go in the countryside. Oh, man. It, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. It's in the air, you know. You, you can feel it the way they look at you, you know. Uh, you, you feel the eyes piercing in your back, you know. Especially if the, the moment they know you. Alistair Crowley's life <clears throat> developed quite normal. Going to school, college and university. 
until at only the age of 19 and still being a teenager he went mountaineering in the Bernese Alps in Switzerland ascending the famous Eiger, Mönch and Jungfrau being a young sportsman from there on things went wrong meeting the wrong people in Switzerland as the Swiss Lea Hirsig from Bernese region where the evil Swiss initiated him in this Egyptian wizard stuff they tried that with me too when infiltrating the octagon but I refused and had to pay dearly for refusing the beast the Swiss beast here you see Alistair Crowley he was born 1875 and in 1894 which you'll see in a minute he went mountaineering in Switzerland so I show that to you now here here it is about the Abbey of Thelema and his youth there and here in 1894 he, he went to the Bernese Alps here yeah? and he climbed the Eiger, Trift, Jungfrau, Mönch, Wetterhorn I mean that's quite an endeavor you know look at that climbing up here so this guy was a good sportsman he was he was on the good way you know until he went to Switzerland here and a couple of years later now we're in 1898 uh, Crowley was in Zermatt in Switzerland and so 1898 then he was um, 23 only now he's spending a lot of time in in Switzerland that's the Bolskein house so oh there he is in the K2 expedition so I mean this guy was a sportsman you know tough guy and uh, everything went haywire when he went to Switzerland meeting the wrong people Look, he's completely sunburned. <laughs> the Swiss took another young man's life, eh? As many. And, well, okay, there's a lot more here. I wanted to show you this here. You can read it all yourself. And what I'm going to show here. This is uh, during the Hitler time. Look, this is from 1930 uh, to 1938. So in April 1930, Crowley moved to Berlin uh, in, the, in the Nazi time, Adolf Hitler. And um, he also knew, uh, look here, Hamilton. Well, we know that those right? the Duke of Hamilton, Order of the Garter, or the Scottish version of it, and uh, so here the Second World War. Look, he knew Ian Fleming. He was also living in Berlin, and at a certain moment, all three of them they were studying. At least Ian Fleming and uh, the Prince Bernhard of the. Um, the German SS Prince of the House of Orange uh, they were all living in Lausanne with Ian Fleming and the Prince they were studying and uh, Alistair Crowley coming there all the time they, they all know each other you know and Ian Fleming well he knew um, Alan Dulles of the OSS 
You know, it's all one bunch, and it's all together with the Mafia, Sicily, Swaziland. It's it's all one thing: the aristocracy, Pharaoh, uh, yeah, Thelema. You look the whole this whole bit satanic belief system it's all based on egypt which which you can see here I just saw it here before uh which i've been telling you all the time it's all yeah it's all based on ancient egypt well, i just saw it before you know but find it yourself you know uh Oh, I don't see it anymore here, but look it up yourself. And just as my code name was Le Relayeur in French, or the Connector in English, something or someone mysteriously burned down Crowley's Bolskine house the very day I was liberated from the evil Swiss grip on winter solstice 2015 i was safe and the intel towards their downfall could commence it's all connected somehow why would simple italians or sicilians have a thing called our thing or cosa nostra in italian meaning a thing or their thing, holding them together under a secret oath of loyalty and secrecy in some sort of an order or a fraternity. Cosa Nostra is in fact related to the typical Templar structures built in a strict internal hierarchy and their belief or their thing to establish the new horizontal rule aristocratic system of the Republic a thrive and push pursuit they called our thing or cosa nostra Templars are very identical to the Mafia and both are ice-cold killers in a brotherhood, backstabbers, multinationals, money makers, drug dealers, thieves, rapists, and a huge enemy to the people. The Mafia is for Southern Europe, but Switzerland is for Northern Europe, with their Swiss octagon. Swiss mercenaries and Swiss banks and of course the Mafia just as any other criminal use the Swiss banks to hoard and stash their money Italians and even the Sicilians do not have a single clue who the Mafia really are where they actually come from and why the Mafia gets protected by the Italian authorities. You see the red rose here in the picture? Well, that stands for the nobility and Pharaoh's Pertasser, Red House of Pharaoh. In fact, at a certain moment, the Knights Templars had an additional secret code by the abbreviation MAFIA in Latin for Mi Amina Fidelem Ius Arian, in Latin meaning My Soul Loyal to the Arian Law, which was their thing or Cosa Nostra, for our thing. Mi Amina Fidelem Ius Arian, as the initials Mafia. An Arian means, in fact, aristocratic, the superior Arian or aristocratic race, who are together with the Swiss 
the instigators of World War II, which I explain in my video here, the nobility world wars. Aryan means noble or high-born, nobility. Yeah? They migrated from Central Asia. They drove horse-drawn chariots that helped them gain power. Well, this sounds very much like the Hyksos, who came from Central Asia and they had horse-drawn chariots and they took over ancient Egypt for a while and probably infiltrated it forever with their brachycephalic skull forms. So both Aryan and Aristocracy, Aryan and Aristocracy, come etymologically out of the pharaonic Ari, meaning born out of the sun, as in Amun-Ra, the sun god of ancient Egypt, where they all come from. Here you can see Aryan, it also means king or a nobleman, noble, nobility, aristocracy. And which I explain giving all the proofs in the 18 hour pentalogy, so it's in Swiss in five parts, called the Swiss Beast, Home of the Devil. Also here translated into Spanish by my Mexican revolutionary friends and supposedly understandable for Italian speakers like the Sicilians with Pino Magnacci. So here it is in Spanish, La Bestia Suiza, La Casa del Mal, Parto Uno. So, and um, you see, this is the channel name, Re y des desprograma y reaprenda. And you see, what she is, what they, what's here, no puedo subir nuevo video hasta el 14 de marzo uh, 2022. So you can see here, um, she, the Mexicans are getting attacked by the Swiss because the Swiss don't want you to see this video and to get this information. So, dear Sicilian people and Italians, please download them very quickly. It's, it's my and our uh, present for humanity. So, you can see they're also on Brighton, Rumble, VK, what is this, O, Facebook. Uh, the Mexicans are really doing a good job. And... Uh, I wish some other peoples could do the same, like Germans and, and French, you know, translate it. But, well, the, uh, until now only the Mexicans are the, are the real hard-working people. Just like in America, the Mexicans do all the hard work, eh? The same here. Idem dito, as, you, as one says in Latin. Idem dito same thing. And here you can see the original title in this channel here. But you have to scroll down because it wouldn't it, it won't pop up if you if you punch in the search machine the Swiss beast home of the devil it won't pop up anymore. Not even in the channel. So you must go into the video section and scroll it down until you get to part one and then you you get to part all the way to part four and part five is on the other channel which you can find also in the uh, in this channel here it's called homeland security i was still a child when i got taught all this by my very traditional family of french descent in south africa so i don't remember if it was Fidelis or Fidelem and Ius or Iura in the word Mafia, M-A-F-I-A. But you just never forget 
anima fidelis ariam, or soul, loyal, nobility, the main words of the secret oath related to the initials of the word mafia, which withholds in fact a secret oath. The word mafia is in fact the oath of this secret order, doing the dirty work for the Knights Templars and the nobility. An oath punished with death, torture, or your children and offspring killed, when one breaks the oath of silence and loyalty, also called the omerta, where the word omerta, which you can see here, together with the typical Freemason handshake, who use the omerta to, because the omerta comes from one of the nine founding fathers of the secret order of the Knights Templars by the name of Godfroy de Saint-Omer, Godfrey of Saint-Omer, Omerta, the Laws of Silence. So he's also called Gofred Godfroy, as I just told you before, Godfrey in English, and sometimes even Geoffrey, like the name Geoffrey, right? And he was one of the nine founding fathers of the Knights Templars, together with this one here, Hugues de Payen, or Hugues de Pain, uh, Bernard de Clairvaux. I went filming the uh, monastery for you, the Cistercian monastery. And remember when I, they almost got me at this Templar commandery with that horrible statue, when there were nine heads, white heads in the forest, you know, referring to the nine original Knights Templars. So this guy he is probably together with this one here, Hugues de Payen or Hugues de Pain, uh, one of the most important guys, you know, uh, of the Knights Templars. So the laws of silence, yeah, the Omer Ta, Omer Ta, Saint Omer, you know, they made it up, you know, they, they made these laws. So, Godefroy de Saint-Omer, Omerta, it's all related, and it comes from the Knights Templars. Mer, in the Demotic, Pharaonic, means the pyramid, and the O used to be an A, standing for big or pregnant, almost as in the word A. America, America, which I explain in my video, The Pharaoh Show. In this case, it means pregnant pyramid for getting born in the pyramid, like Napoleon getting reborn in the big pyramid of Gizeh and many others who got initiated there. So Saint Omer, like in Godefroy, de Saint-Omer, one of the nine uh, founders of the Knights Templars. Saint-Omer, it means the holy birth giving pyramid. Ta, in Omer, Ta, it means land. So, Omerta, for A, Mer, Ta, means born in the lands of the pyramids, or we were born in the lands of the pyramids, and Saint Omer, like in Godefroy de Saint Omer. Saint Omer, it means we come out of the land of the holy pyramids. I made this video here on my channel Chatzefratz many years ago. The words are in German, like before saying Schwanger, in German meaning pregnant. But this, these are just a few of the demotic words. So I, I don't have my books anymore. 
neither do I have this one here because I only have my backpack now and uh, okay this was interesting about America you can see you know America it means pyramid sun soul energy I explained it in my video um, the Pharaoh show I hear it says the Pharaoh show and others there's neither an Italian nor a Sicilian word called omerta I knew more of this family heritage I got but I forgot it over the drag of time as I was still very young at the time it was supposed to be repeated in adulthood but due to political turmoil I had to leave South Africa before and got expelled from my family so mafia is the oath and omerta to whom the oath was directed to like I swear on the head of Saint Omer and you can see here the red rose of the nobility of the red Pertasser of Pharaoh and here in red and white Templars colors it's one and the same thing the authorities the Knights Templars the Mafia the government police the CIA the FBI it's all one and the same thing the Nazis the Freemasons it, it all has the same source and they all work together against humanity in English his name is Godfrey of Saint Omer and he was one of the initial two men on one horse together with Hugues de Payen or also called Hugues de Pain in the north of France near Calais there's still the town of Saint Omer Saint Omer where he was born in 1075 and here you can see his coat of arms so here's Saint Omer it's uh, and here's the coat of arms of the town and of the um, the, the, um, the founding father of the Knights Templars and here it is here's Saint Omer here's Dover and here's Calais uh, you can read it well there's nothing it's not much to read I think the most important things they're not in it yeah so okay so you remember this coat of arms very well now look how it looks and print it in your mind so here again the coat of arms the same as in the town of Saint Omer near England and uh, so he was from the nobility you know Geoffroy de Saint Omer de the prefix de it means he's of the nobility the founder of the order of the temple so this is in French so the ones who everyone who speaks French you can try to read it it's quite interesting and otherwise well, you just look at the pictures eh? and uh, so I was looking for a there's another picture this is Saint Omer uh, and here in the town it's, it's where the uh, the Templars were where the arrow is oh look Saint Omer it's a star fort can you see this it's a star fort oh, what do you know and here are the Templars situated I guess England is here and 
There it is, the symbol here. Here. Yeah, this is a temple in Saint Omer, probably. Uh, there it is. That's I think it was the coat of arms of this of the guy. So look again, look very good at the image here because I'm show it, I'm, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Again, somewhere else. So if you want to read it, just punch pause. Another Templar dude in the church. It's probably him. So, and this is where the word Omerta it comes from. You know, total loyalty to the, uh, the the founding fathers of the Knights Templars. Yeah, the two guys on one horse. One of them is Saint uh, Geoffroy de Saint Omer. The other one is probably Hugues de Pain or Hugues de Payen. Uh, it's been used in, in, in both ways. Well, here it's again Hugues de Payen. Uh, here they say Hugues de Pain. See, that's, um, they use it in different ways. You know. Of course, you know, some people wrote in the Middle Ages, some people wrote it this way, the others they wrote something this way. And uh, The Saint Omer crest is the same as the flag here of the two crossed arms pharaohs Ursula von der Leyen and Susanna Kaputova, which you can see in this video here. So this is the flag of Slovakia and you can ask yourself why do they have this Templars, double Templars or Hospitaller cross if you'd like and the crest of uh, uh, Godefroy de Saint-Omer where the word Omerta is coming from why do they have it in their flag? You know? It's again the pharaonic Omerta Laws of silence, they're not going to tell you one day now. Omerta. So it's in this channel here and it's this video here. There it is again Susanna Chaputova or Kaputova, the president of the Slovak Republic. Now, why do they have the crest of uh, Saint Omer with their Omerta in the flag of Slovakia? Huh? And as it is so important as for the ones who haven't seen this yet, I show you the, the crossed armed ladies once again here. This is Chaputova with the uh, the crest of um, Saint Omer, the Templar, and here Ursula von der Leyen of the um, of the German high nobility, and um, so. Her crest, it means, you know, like Saint, Saint Omer Ta, it means we come out of the land of the Holy Pyramids. And this is exactly what they're showing. Uh, and again, for the ones who haven't seen it yet, I show it in this video here on the same channel. Sarko Soul Soccer from Swit Sar Land. The land of Sar, and it's all related. We've been ruled by the pharaohs for 2000 years, people. The global mafia is a Templar branch, and therefore, in South America, there are the drug lords of the cartels who call themselves Los Templarios which is Spanish, that means the Templar, the Templars. So here you can see a Templar's cross. And just as they were in America, the Newport uh, Castle or whatever it was, of course they were also in Mexico. And uh, maybe someone can look it up. I guess this is the region here. Yeah, the state of Michoacan. Yeah. 
So I, there must be some Templar artifacts being found there, or maybe uh, castles like in uh, in Newport in America. And uh, let's be honest, simple Mexicans could never be that highly organized as the Latino drug cartels are. Only Pharaoh's nobility can do this, not the people. And in fact, in Latin America, the drug cartels are led by the Spanish nobility and the Templars, Templarios, who have settled their internal wars now since 1945 for a 100%, all working together against humanity, both Templar Republicans and feudal royalists in today's battle of the mind, killing our youth with their drugs and protected by their police, who all come out of the octagon and full of Freemasons, like here the Order of the Garter and King Philippa of Spain. So here you see a lot of octagons on his breast. And this is the Order of the Garter with Oniswa Kimalipans and here as well. See my video about that. And this is the Cross of St. George, like from the Georgia Guidestones. See my film Octogon, the Empire of Darkness on my channel Gatsafrats, which you can see here. Same thing in Russia where the Russian Mafia have an octagon for symbol, which they tattoo on their backs and knees, or wear in gold chains or here in wood. As I met some Russian mobsters from Georgia, so the land of Georgia, and they were driving in big black limousines with German number plates while I was hitchhiking in France, which you can see in this video here on the same channel. It says the title, Members of Russian Mafia Octogon of the Knights Templars for uh, Vorizagonia. This is Russian here, Vorizagonia. That's the name of them. I spoke German with them and they apparently stopped to see the huge octagon symbol in stone on the floor, which you can see in the video. They were very surprised when I told them that the Vorizagonia, the name for the Russian Mafia, is all infiltrated and taken over by the nobility. Yes, he said, how do you know? Look, this Russian mobster of the Vorizagonia. Here you see the Russian letters, the Cyrillic. He even has a Templar's cross with a square in it. Like the, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, they also have a square in the middle like this, or like, you know, the corner down. Because they know exactly where they come from and so does the Italian Mafia. They know it, people. That's why he has here, got meet uns. That's what the Nazis had, or, or all the Germans actually, on their belt, which means God with us. So this guy has it here. I mean, he's Russian. And the Nazis, they killed like 30 million Russians and their children. You know? So why would a Russian have it? Because he's of an organization by the Knights Templars, you know. So here you see the Templars, and here you see the Nazis, the Nazi Templars. And even the spider's web here is uh, octagonal. They know it. You know, it's all one thing, you know. The authorities, the mafia, the justice department, the politicians, the media. It's all one dirty, lying bunch. 
All these mobsters, they're just like the police. They all they come with money and they act masculine and they think they're strong against one. You know, just like the police. Because it's the same organization. It all comes out of the Knights Templars. The police have a lot of octagon badges and so does the Russian Mafia. And they all carry Jesus, like the Templars, like the Italian Mafia, the Cosa Nostra, the Russian Mafia, you see here the Russian Cyrillic letters. It's the same people. The police are the legal Mafia and this is the illegal Mafia. And they are cowards, they are, they are a menace to humanity. We should get rid of them. Now, and also, therefore, in the Pino Magnacci film, one can see in part five the Italian policeman Carabinieri Maggiore or Major Marco De Chirico, and aristocratic name of the Italian nobility, with a octagon badge at the Pino Magnacci court case to announce his allegiance to all the initiated ones and all conspiring against the brave Sicilian radio man Pino Magnacci of Delegiato. They always leave a sign or a symbol somewhere so they recognize each other because they think we are stupid and in fact we are stupid very stupid so watch my video octogon the empire of darkness if you want to understand this octogon here this is in uh, from 1992 the sicilian judge giovanni falcone the falcon it's already quite suspicious, the Falcon. Well, anyway, this is interesting. He was born in 1939 in the Kingdom of Italy. Um, I already showed you that before, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Um, well, you can, you can read the whole story yourself. So, but what is important? So, Antonio Ingroia, who was a friend of this guy, so I'm talking to him. Antonio Ingroia, I need to tell you that your friend and mentor, Judge Giovanni Falcone, was not killed by the Mafia in 1992 as the hit was far too professional for the Mafia. Only Octogon could have done this, and the Templar Octogon, whom I infiltrated in Schaffhausen, Switzerland, is also the top organization giving the orders to Gladio and the Bologna bombings. Normally for executions and operations in Italy the Octogon has a team come over from another country for the so to speak Omerta and quite applicable in this case in order to keep the lid on and seal the, li the lips. And I know for sure that in the Falcone execution in 1992, the British increment has been used, just as in the Lady Diana elimination five years later. So I don't know if you remember the Falcone murder in 1992. They uh, drilled a hole in the motorway in Sicily and um, so you got a tube, an open tube, you know, going from the motorway to under the bridge where they stashed a lot of explosive. 
which they triggered by remote control. Now in 1992 this is not a thing the Mafia could have done and they still can't do this you know. This is uh, this is the legal Mafia behind it who protect the Mafia you know, because it all comes from out of the um, out of the Knights Templars, both do. You know. So I'll let you read it yourself. Here's about the UKN. So there are rumors that the increment have been involved in several high profile events such as the death of Princess Diana and Dodi Al Fayed. Which is true. I can guarantee that. Here also in part 5 you can see the corrupt elite judge Silvana Saguto with a pharaonic brooch showing the Egyptian sun hieroglyph showing her aristocratic allegiance to everyone everyone with eyes for it like me Homie Ross showing many sun hieroglyphs here in this video here the Pharaoh show and here one more time a pharaonic brooch the of the sun hieroglyph of course it's not exactly the sun hieroglyph here but it does represent it and you see there's a red square in it and two circles the circle stands for the compass and square is the square so it does say square and compass and red it, st it stands for the nobility as the Pertasser, the red house of Pharaoh so she's one of them and highly criminal in fact uh, though it is the typical sun hieroglyph which they show on all buildings I realized it was in a different form and when I had a closer look at it when watching the clip again I realized that the square brooch had a little opening in it wow incredible so this means she is showing the pharaonic per or per hieroglyph meaning a house so this is the pharaonic hieroglyph of a house Brr. only the brooge of the woman it's upside down the opening is here but that doesn't really matter and inside it's red so it says house red red house and as the square is red it says the red house of lower Egypt so she's saying to a pharaonic clan and an enemy within that she's also from the nobility and most likely from the house of Bourbon to Sicilies and here you see the Duke of Castro so you know Fidel Castro from Cuba so this means there never was any problem with Cuba and the United States of America they're all the same ruling they just have the people fight each other and it was Fidel Castro you know, from the house of Castro he um, betrayed Che Guevara and uh, you know because he was too uh, too famous amongst the people he was too popular and here's the coat of arms there's a lot of things to recognize in it you know Fleur de Lis oh, this looks like Catalonia lions I oh, look here Saint George there he is again the killer like the St. George Guidestones that's where it comes from and Templar crosses it's, it's full of it eh? 
and this symbol you got uh, above the 28th degree in Freemasonry Scottish Rite you've got this symbol here which is a very interesting fact as she's in danger and facing more than 10 years in prison for corruption and nepotism she is desperate and begs for help from her community thus showing the ones in power that she is also from Pharaoh's Pertasser Red House of Egypt who became Europe's nobility of course the original hieroglyph of the sun is a circle with a dot in it and the one depicted on the buildings by a circle and two bars on each side is slightly different but it does in fact represent the sun hieroglyph thousands of years later in Europe and thousands of miles away from the river Nile so and here see you see again like the bridge she was having and this is the the per hieroglyph meaning a house the per or per hieroglyph even the symbol for download has the Egyptian per or per hieroglyph for house you download and bring it into your house so this is another way how these pharaohs like the judge the corrupt judge Silvana Saguto they give secret messages to each other so here again the Egyptian hieroglyph of house and here you can see her with a necklace with three balls on it for the concept of three which is them the elite our masters and we the people are the concept of four at the base of the pyramids hierarchy while the concept of three is the triangle or delta as they prefer to call it forming the triangular side of the pyramid all the way low leading to the top she even shows the concept of three vertically as for the vertical rule of a feudal system and normally due to the to gravity the three balls would have surged the lowest point so this is all deliberate and very meticulously prepared my house is the house of Saint Croix Rose du Plessis with our motto non facet pugnum digito uno in Latin meaning with one finger only one cannot make a fist well actually it's not entirely the same motto as I'm not allowed to use it anymore and I have to respect that so I made the motto myself by slightly changing it but it means the same and already as a child I got initiated in all this and I would never have told anyone if not me and my children would have been so heavily terrorized for such a long time by the Swiss octagon so they left me no other choice than to speak out and open up the lid of Pandora's pharaonic box Switzerland is the head office of the global Templar Mafia where they all keep all their money also the Nazis belong to this Templar Mafia which I have already explained in many videos so therefore it might appear contradictory that in 1943 before the landings by the Allies in Sicily the OSS 
the Office of Strategic Services and predecessor of the CIA asked the help of the Sicilian Mafia against the Nazis as in fact the Nazis were and still are in the same global family with the OSS, CIA and the Mafia who all come out of the Templars and ruled by the Octogon out of Switzer land where Alan Dulles of the OSS Switzerland the head of the later CIA had his headquarters in Bern, Switzerland. Alan Welsh Dolls came out of the very powerful Geneva family Malé Prévost from Switzerland, about whom you can see more in this video here on my channel Hatzefratz. So this video here, Alan Dahls was Swiss family Mali Prévost. In fact, in Sicily in 1943, there were no more real Nazis left, but only some expendable German soldiers who were left, who could be eliminated and betrayed by the Mafia who gave all the German military positions to their pals in the OSS. How else can you explain with the basic understanding of how things work on this planet that a criminal organization like the Mafia helps the US military in a military campaign? Where's the catch? What are we missing here? Who's gaining what and how did the US government know on which random door to knock in rural Sicily? Well, unless they already knew each other, because in fact they belong to the very same organization, who we'll all converge and come together at the top. This is also the reason that drugs from the various mafias around the globe get smuggled in by NATO's various air forces into the various western countries. With the police doing absolutely nothing, whereas the entire drug trade and drugs consummation in all the cities could easily be stopped within 24 hours if they would just use all the police in today's streets who are mobilized to terrorize humanity in Pharaoh's global bog war against humanity if they would use all these police for only one single day we could stop the drugs and the consummation of drugs everything only for one or two days all these police in the streets now the lie is their biggest weapon and backed up by their indoctrination media and with some excellent rhetoric by some brilliant actors, the majority of the dumb slaves believe everything. Therefore, later on in history, both the CIA and the Mafia were involved in the preparation of the assassination of US President John F. Kennedy, which got eventually executed by the British increment because political assassinations inside the US are always done by the UK increment and vice versa liquidations inside the UK are being done by a special detachment inside the CIA and the increment finally take the orders from the Swiss octagon 
And what a coincidence again. This is exactly the same, the very same way the Mafia operates. A murder in New York gets done by some salesman or a Catholic priest or some other disguise flown in from Palermo, Sicily. And a murder in Sicily gets done by some innocent looking American tourist visiting Sicily. Well, how come they work so similar both in the Mafia and official Western government organizations? Huh? Well, because it's one and the same gang called Octogon of the Nazi Templars and they are based in the Alps. And forget about the Israeli Mossad in all this, who are the most clumsy secret service in the world, creating one global scandal after the other because of their unprofessional clumsiness. I hear about the assassination attempt on Khaled Marshall. I hope I pronounced that right. And here about the assassination attempt. <clears throat> they tried to put some uh, in his left ear. They put a, a poison in his ear with a uh, with a spray. And the picture you saw before that was a um, in that hotel in the uh, in the Arab Emirates. It also went over the. Uh, over the entire globe in all newspapers and there's a lot more and this should just shouldn't happen with a uh, a uh, intelligence service the Mossad is only considered the best in the world because they accumulate the best human or human intel human intelligence information about anything they need or need not to know because of the impressive backup space of the jaywalker community all over the world providing the best human intel the best humans and a tremendous quantity of jaywalkers offering safe houses in such high numbers that every operator has his own safe house which of course minimizes local attention drawn in and eventual detection in the end. But when it comes to Mossad operations they're as clumsy as ten rabbis trying to circumcise a camel or two as we used to say. From my own experience, the Royal Military Intelligence, including Team 5, Detachment 6 and the Increment, are the most professional in the business. You don't see them, you don't hear them, they don't leave traces as if they don't even exist. An absolute shadowy organization of mostly noblemen at the top and in the field who receive their final orders in the end from the Swiss Octogon through an intricate network of Freemasons and Nazi Templars. So here you see it's royal, their, their crest, the badge and it has red here for the Red House and white for the White House of Pharaoh, the Per Tasser and the Per Het. So these royals, they can come out of these ones from Egypt, who became the royals, and here on top you see the Knights Templars. And um, so. Uh, 
Well, here you see these ones here. We all know about that. It almost, the SIS, it almost sounds like ISIS. Right? And, um, you know, General Sir is from Sar, meaning a king, a pharaoh. It's like a, uh, It's like a uh, a mob of royal gangsters, they are. So when President John F. Kennedy wanted to stop the CIA from importing drugs from South America, drugs from Vietnam and Laos into the US, and stop the CIA from working together with the Mafia, then JFK became a priority on Octagon's death list. Just as when I, Sean Ross, criticized another branch of the Octagon crime syndicate by making documentaries and writing in international newspapers about the Swiss Nazi Templar banks, I too moved up fairly high on Octagon's death list and even had Swiss Nazi cops shoot at me in the forest. So this video is on this channel here and here's the title. Of course Oliver Stone's video JFK from 1991 was meant to put you on a wrong lead well, what else can you expect from government's Hollywood and their government agenda? Yes, okay, the Mafia were involved in the hit, as they are one and the same thing belonging to the Octagon, which was already getting known in books written after JFK's murder. Well, so nothing new really. So the government's Hollywood state's propaganda had to keep it that way before people were going to dig any deeper by putting a Hollywood final seal on the case through that JFK movie. I already made documentaries about the Swiss involvement in the JFK murder ten years ago, but Swissy made YouTube take them off, and after two extensive Swiss house searches, I don't have them anymore either, as the Swiss Nazi police stole all my hard disks, memory sticks, CDs, computers, cameras and SD cards. President Kennedy knew about the enemy within and that the CIA, the Cocaine Import Agency, only pretended to fight drugs and in reality only eliminated the competition. So Kennedy put FBI agents in the Pentagon in a so-called TDY program for temporary duty yonder. Like agent Tom O'Loughlin being a SAXA agent for SAXA, S-A-C-S-A, -S -A, Special Assistant for Counterintelligence and Special Activities. So I read it for you because this is important, SAXA, to direct special operations in the Kennedy administration, the Joint Chiefs of Staff created a new organization headed by a general officer with the title Special Assistant for Counterintelligence and Special Activities, SAXA. Colonel Fletcher Prouty of the Air Force Special Operation Command was tasked with forming the new organization. 
The Kennedy administration wanted to have a new team, so General Ed Lansdale, a CIA man who had run special operations since the CIA-sponsored Hawk Rebellion in the Philippines, was passed over. The new SAXA official was to have control over all special operations, including those of the CIA, which was ordered to turn its special operation files over to the Joint Chiefs. To staff the office, an operations planner was needed, someone who was familiar with intelligence and special operations, but not a CIA man. Moreover, Kennedy needed someone who would be respected by all the services and intelligence agencies for honesty. So this is why they sent the FBI sexa man in the doing the TDY, um, the officer, the special agent, uh, Tom O'Loughlin. So the octagon killed Kennedy's man, Tom O'Loughlin, at the young age of 51 years only, poisoned in or around the Pentagon, quickly torn apart by a strategical cancer, so to say, at the age of 51. And here's the FBI, here Tom with J. Edgar Hoover, or Gay Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI. And you all know now, through my videos, who that he was uh, from the Swiss Huber, looking exactly like President Herbert Hoover, also from the Huber family. So, no luck, eh? FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, also called Gay Edgar Hoover, real name Hoover from Switzerland, and U.S. President Herbert Hoover, real name Hoover from Switzerland, are from the very same Swiss Nazi Templar bloodline, which you can see in the picture comparison of this video here on my channel Hatzefratz. And they were both members of the Swiss Octogon from the Alps, bringing havoc to the US, going for all key positions and stabbing the American people in the back. You can see how they are lookalikes, these two here. This is uh, J. Edgar Hoover, the same brachycephalic broadheads, and here Herbert Hoover. And these uh, cephalic uh, skull forms are not European. European have long, Europeans have long heads, uh, which you can see in my video about Perset. And here's the title, but you probably have to scroll it down in the video section here because YouTube is uh, desperately trying, you know, to hide all my videos with, of course, the Swiss pushing behind it. Or you can take the title here and then put it a little bit more to the right here in the search bar in my channel, then it might pop out. And otherwise, you go and look for it in my Ahava 528 Israeli channel on the Israeli video platform. And here, a video I made 10 years ago about the Swiss involvement in the Kennedy assassination. And while you're at it, watch this video here, watch it too. Uh, how Swissy had the army shoot and kill unarmed U.S. war veterans. So here's the title. The best is to um, to copy the title and uh, in my channel here, 
and then punch it in the search bar here in the channel or maybe scroll it down but even if you scroll it down and you know YouTube is trying to hide it because um, you know the ones in power they don't want you to see these videos so you better download them and I'll try to put the uh, the links uh, in the description for you Agent Olaflin's nickname was Mr. Hammer, indicating the man's formidable capacities and therefore needed to be terminated without further delay before the Hammer could do more damage to Octagon's business model, leading from the jungle's opium forests of Southeast Asia to the Octagon's motherland in the Alps where all the money is stashed and where Alan Dulles, the very first CIA director, had made many worthwhile Nazi contacts during the war. That's why the paper clip here in the picture replacing the stars that once were. And those Nazis were all on drugs like Hitler and Goering being hooked on cocaine, speed and what not. From the top all the way down to the ordinary German soldiers all carrying a tube of speed tablets called Per Vitin for the hard moments like shooting a bunch of children and their mothers in a mass grave and then shovel a few tons of sand over it. In these cases Per Vitin was required, not really like Popeye opening a can of spinach. Hi Hitler! This is the war of the mind, what I was telling you about. And because the Nazis won the war, right after the Nazi victory of World War II and taking over the US through the paperclip, the drug wars started to mess up our children's brains in the war of the mind just as the actual drug war being forced upon humanity in Pharaoh's bug war to take control over our minds. Hi Hitler guys, have fun now. Per in the word Per Vitin means a house in Pharaonic Demotic, like a royal house or bloodline, indicating the ones behind it, as usual. In 1971, when Special Agent Olaflin died, murdered by people who smiled in his face, he hadn't watched any YouTube yet and how his FBI director J. Edgar Hoover, real name was Huber, a Swiss American, who also was a member of the notorious Octogon, wanting special agent Olaflin dead. Olaflin's code name in the Sexa detachment was Macduff. Just as you can see here on this channel name, Macduff Lives. So years, and in fact decennia later, Olaflin's son, John Olaflin, opened up a YouTube channel by the name of Macduff Lives. And we did an interview there last month on December 7th. 2021. It says interview, there we are, interview with me 
and the title is a little bit longer uh, one month ago but as I just had contracted the Wu flu I was still recovering and in the interview searching for the words in my empty mind due to the brain fog provoked by Pharaoh's bug war I'm fine again now by just recovering the natural way in this huge winter solstice blood ritual starting on December 21st 2019 winter solstice you know, watch this film the biggest winter solstice blood ritual ever on the same channel here John wrote me this in his book entitled Macduff lives which he had sent me to Sean Ross with deep respect and gratitude John O'Loughlin and don't you think that the Chinese did it concerning the spread and creation of the Wu flu pharaonic bug as to my knowledge of modern history nowhere in history the Chinese applied biological warfare against human beings but there is another country doing this all the time America like the Phoenix program to destroy the Vietnamese people's traditional way of life and culture and force the villagers into strategic hamlets the murder of indigenous leaders the computerized war in which people were killed by assassination squads and look here it says Phoenix program <laughs> Phoenix <laughs> yeah, yeah look there's the official US badge with the Phoenix and Joachim and Boas well, I already told you what Phoenix is a reference to eh? it says Pung Huang no idea what that means the US Phoenix program is America's equivalent of the Nazi operation Reinhardt murdering the jaywalkers well no wonder when you consider that all the paperclip Nazis disappeared into the US in 1945 enabling their worldwide extermination wars by the Swiss Nazi Templar Octogon yeah Operation Reinhardt in Wikipedia yeah another Phoenix program it's all related to the Knights Templars Phoenix and of course the Phoenix program using Agent Orange by Monsanto killing the Vietnamese by the millions and still dying today of massive cancer as Agent Orange is still in the drinking water and here it says an estimated 150,000 children in Vietnam they were born with serious birth effects well the Phoenix make sure that the Knights Templars that they rise again and all the rest will never rise again like 150,000 children will not rise again like a Phoenix these Vietnamese children will never fly again as a phoenix they're grounded forever they will not be happy children this is the present of America they're pages after pages after pages 
So China doesn't do this. It's America doing this. Don't believe the Western newspapers. Well, I hope the Chinese will rescue us from all this misery. I hope the Russians will clean it all up. And all this gender bender stuff and, and you know, killing the families. And, and I hope the Chinese and the Russians will come. I, I dearly do hope so. Look at this, people. Look at this. Chinese don't do this. Forget it. It's America. And they do it over and over and over again. Yeah, see, the children of Agent Orange. I'll give you all the proofs. I, I like facts. So, you know, who is behind the bug war, eh? From Wuhan. The Chinese? Oh, forget it. Oh, forget it. You can see the same children in Iraq now and in Afghanistan because of depleted uranium. America did it. Wakey, wakey. John F. Kennedy wanted to stop all these atrocities and stop the Phoenix program and had to pay the ultimate price for his attempt. And so did SEXA agent Tom O'Loughlin. And he said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Do you understand this? Who are the ones who make peaceful revolution impossible? I mean, look at Kazakhstan at the moment. I'm sure the people wanted a peaceful revolution, but the ones in power didn't want this. So, because they want to have a violent revolution, Ordo Apkao. So, they moved it this way. They killed a couple of Protestant um, protesters. And uh, this is the way they do it. They don't want peaceful revolutions. The elite, they don't want change. They don't want us to be happy. You know, they want to kill us. Yeah. This guy, who under he understood it. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, we, we could use this guy on YouTube. Eh? This guy would have been the best YouTuber or info warrior of, of all. So, go and see his channel, uh, sort of. The Phoenix, of course, as in the Vietnam Phoenix program of the CIA and the US, is of course, again, a reference to ancient Egypt and the Knights Templars, who rose again out of the fire of the French king and resurrected in Swaziland, the Phoenix program, <laughs> a typical name chosen by the Octogon. And in the middle of all this was Mr. Hammer, special agent of the FBI, and Kennedy's man to smash the CIA, who got poisoned through the CIA's special virus cancer program to eliminate people with silent weapons for silent wars, easily eating up a man like Mr. Hammer, Tom O'Loughlin, from the inside, until his body resigned at the age of 51, a tree of a man who would never resign any assignment. You just don't touch Octogon's money business, like the CIA's Air America, bringing in tons of drugs into the US, and into the entire Western world. Just another multinational Knights Templar business in collaboration with the Mafia, the CIA, Swaziland, Nazis, etc. 
So here you see the statistics, the opium cultivation in Afghanistan from 1994 to 2014. So that's uh, uh, 20 years in uh, hectares. And this here, I guess it's in kilos. From 1994, 71,000 kilos, that's 71 tons. And here it's rising and it's rising. Here it's in 2014, 200, more than 200 tons of opium or heroin. And, um, but why here in 2001, when the Taliban were ruling, only eight tons you know so well that's because the taliban forbid opium in afghanistan and the use of drugs because these guys they said well we are real muslims and this is not um, this is not very uh, islamic the drugs so they forbid it and this was the reason one of the reasons but the main reason for nato and the cia and the octagon and the mafia you know to invade afghanistan all under pretext of the world trade center and, and whatnot but you can see you know all statistics they all show this not only here they all show the same columns and here you can see American soldiers that are protecting the opium trade, patrolled by US NATO forces, Afghanistan's freedom and democracy, opium fields supply 90% of the world's heroin. So if you look at 2020, the columns are probably like here. And uh, so this is what happened. You know, it's, it's, all, it's all about business, geostrategical wars. And uh, don't believe the newspapers, no, it's all a lie. Therefore, Switzerland is the center of drugs in Europe, where I personally saw people coming from everywhere into Switzerland to get their dose. I mean, Switzerland is the center of everything. It's the diplomatic center, it's the center of money, it's a center of all the NGOs, so I wouldn't be the center of drugs. And drugs is money, because it, it's the base of it all. And look at it, you know, Zurich, second place. Uh, this is about the, um, the cocaine in the wastewater in European cities. And there's even two cities here, Geneva. Also a lot, and London a lot less, and then there are the other um, European cities here in this um, statistics. And just look at this here, uh, Amsterdam and Zurich. There is a reason that um, Amsterdam is at the first place, and this reason is um, connected to Switzerland. And I'll tell you why. Or you would say, okay, Amsterdam, it's a port. That's where it all comes in. But here you see London. You, you see part of it. It's 700, so it's a lot less than here. Uh, you, you would ask yourself, why not London? It's also a big port. Why Amsterdam at the first place? And there are, there are even bigger ports like uh, Le Havre in France, which, which is has nothing. You know, There is a reason. This Amsterdam statistics is connected to Switzerland, and I'm going to show you how. Because it all comes from Switzerland, that's where it gets in. Because they're all corrupted, the police is corrupted, uh, they're gangsters, they lie, they, they kill people, it's, um, it's octagon. And the Swiss, of course, use the ancient Templar waterway of the Rhine to transport the drugs from Basel to Rotterdam. So Pharaoh's media can say that drugs come in through the port 
of Rotterdam, which is a thing you know that's easily believed <coughs> because because of the laws of silence around Switzerland, there shouldn't be any connection at all to Switzerland. It it's always has to be uh, avoided. <coughs> And already the Romans, they used this waterway, and the kings and the queens, and of course the Knights Templars. So they got Rhine ships. You see, here's Basel, here's Switzerland. Basel, it gets flowing in here, in Zurich and Basel. And it goes by ship. It goes here to Rotterdam, uh, one of the biggest port ports in the world. And then they can say, okay, you know, that's where it comes from. It it always has to be done like this. So there won't be any talk about Switzerland. And I mean, then you can ask yourself, here is an even bigger port, or just as big. It's the biggest port of France. It's called Le Havre, H-A-V-R-E. You know, the river can also brings it to, uh, straight to Paris. And uh, so, you know, that, that would be very important. But why why aren't any drugs here in La Havre? Why all here? Well, the reason is this, the Rhine River. That's how they do it. And of course, uh, you know, the Freemasons, they got it all protected and the police in their hands. So nobody is ever going to control this here. The Rhine ships, all the tons, they're all coming in here like this. It's the biggest river in Europe, the Rhine. And it floats from Basel to Rotterdam. And in fact, uh, this is interesting, you know, with satellites. satellites. Uh, they could see, you know, here's the Thames somewhere, or here. And underneath the North Sea, you can still see how the Thames, or the Rhine, the Rhine is in fact the Thames, how it, uh, how it went in older times like here, where the sea is, and it's still visible. It's quite interesting. So this is a Templar's way to get the drugs from, by the Octogon, from the uh, neutral Omerta, Laws of Silence, Switzerland, into Rotterdam and of course the um, the Royal House of Orange well, they're deep into Nazism and drugs and and whatever you name it you know, they had the Prince of Darkness uh, it's the richest family in the world you know, the House of Orange and uh, they, had, they had the Prince of Darkness who founded the Bilderbergers, and the, which is the highest Freemason group. And uh, the Rhine River, this is the secret. I made these short videos about it, you know, showing here in Switzerland. Uh, it's about 10 years ago. So this one here yeah, and this one. I'll put the links in the uh, description for you. No, not the state of China spreads viruses, nor does it trade drugs, but America does with its corrupted government dealing drugs, spreads viruses, or uses depleted uranium in the Muslim world, killing Afghans, Iraqis, Libyans, Syrians, Bosnians, and even Serbs, by the millions dying of cancer because of the depleted uranium. Just like Agent Orange in Vietnam. It says Agent Orange in Wikipedia. A lot of nice pictures. Um, there's some more pictures. It's amazing. It 
terrible. Even using helicopters, look at that. So in here you can see how Monsanto, you know, it even killed the, the veterans, you know, it was government, they even killed their own people, you know, and it says class action lawsuit that um, Several lawsuits have been filed against the companies which produced Agent Orange. Among them Dow Chemical, Chemical Diamond Shamrock and here, look at this, Monsanto is also in it. So Monsanto's best known product is Roundup, a glyphosate based herbicide developed in the 1970s. And uh, well, the glyphosate, well, it creates cancer at least. Uh, there they are, Monsanto. How lovely! They got a plant in their logo. And apparently, before that, uh, the um, Agent Orange it was produced. It was invented by Bayer. And, and Bayer became at a certain moment IG Farben, who uh, produced the uh, Cyclone B, Zyklon B. This is the infant, which is really uh, uh, nothing but a, but a gift of the democracy that the United States has installed in, Af installed in Afghanistan. This is the hor hor horrific deformity, deformity from which thousands and thousands of Afghans will be dying from and in generations upon generations of Afghans will be suffering from. This is the crime that deserves nothing but a total uh, uh, justice and a total justice nothing but the, but the destruction and defamation of those who have committed this. This is the tragedy and travesty of Afghanistan and this is the product of so-called democracy. Nothing but a horrific deformity. No, no, no. China doesn't do these things, but America does over and over again, all over the world, throughout the entire history of this new world order. Freemason state called USA. The US biological warfare started on Native Americans when on May 24th 1763 in order to crush the Pontiac uprising the US sent blankets infected by smallpox to kill the Indians and their children, just as the US recently did in the Muslim world and in Korea and in Vietnam. Be very careful when the US comes with hearts and minds and give you something. No, 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 China doesn't do these things but the US does using weapons of mass destruction like viruses, Agent Orange, depleted uranium, poisoning their own FBI agents, 
you name it. Forget about Wu Flu, China. The Chinese don't do this. And neither their bets on the Chinese market. The idea to use the infected blanket biological warfare to clean the US from their indigenous population came from a Swissy, colonel in the US Army, former Swiss mercenary in service for the Dutch and British royals and born in Roll, Switzerland, 1719 by the name of Henri-Louis Bouquet, without any doubt a member of the Templar's Octogon. So here he is. Charming chap, isn't he? A Swizzy. And uh, a lot of red for the, uh, for the Old World's Order. A little bit of white. Now, this is where it started, the, uh, the Red House of Pharaoh, and this is the New World's Order, the horizontal rule. There's, there's nothing without a coincidence with these guys. Huh? So, I'll read it for you. So, he was born here in the Swiss Confederacy, and uh, Allegiance, Dutch Republic, Kingdom of Sardinia, huh? Sar, you remember the Shards? The Chardin and Great Britain. It says he was a colonel. Um, there, he was a colonel. Fort Pitt. Hmm. So Henri Bouquet, Henri Louis Bouquet, generally known as Henry Bouquet. And uh, he was born in uh, 1719, died 1765. Was a Swiss mercenary who rose to the prominence in British service during the French and Indian War and Pontiac's War. Bouquet is best known for his victory over a Native American f force at the Battle of Bushy Run, lifting the siege of Fort Pitt during Pontiac's war. During the conflict, Bouquet gained lasting infamy, you know, lasting infamy, and there he is again with his lasting infamy, you know, with his biological warfare and genocide. In an exchange of letters with his commanding officer, Amherst, who suggested a form of biological warfare in the use of blankets infected with smallpox, which were to be distributed to the Native Americans. Despite this indictment, historians have praised Bouquet for well, etc. And it was actually Bouquet who uh, came with the idea, which I'll tell you, which I'll show you later, because the letters are still there. Bouquet was born into a moderately wealthy family in Roll in Switzerland. There's Roll. Now look at the castle, eh? And here's the Swiss Confederacy. And the oldest of seven brothers, the son of a Swiss roadhouse owner and his well-to-do wife, he entered military service at the age of 17. Like many military officers of his day, Bouquet traveled between countries serving as a professional soldier. Now, this is all because of the Knights Templars. All the mercenaries in Europe killing Europeans, they're all Swiss. And this is all, and all commanded by the Knights Templars. He began his military career in the army of the Dutch Republic. There you go. And I already showed you this. So now we are in the 18th century, like 17, 100 and, um, 48, well that, that's exactly this, because uh, after that's after the uh, 30 year war, when 150,000 Swiss mercenaries um, uh, took, took up service for the Dutch king, um, and that's exactly this area, and who became the Dutch police. And um, I already showed you that in, in a video somewhere, I don't know where it is. 
on my channel Gatsefrat, so maybe it was on my channel Gyure. And later he was in the service of the kingdom of Sardinia. You know, that's the word Sar. And in 1748 uh, he was again in Dutch service as a lieutenant colonel um, of the Swiss Guards. And here's about the Pontiac's War. And, uh, real charming chap. He lives on and in for me. And here's what they... Um, a month later, in a series of letters between Bouquet and his commander, General Jeffrey Amherst, a baron, you know, it says baron, with a big octagon on his chest, again, red and white, the idea of using smallpox blankets, so biological warfare. Don't you think the Chinese did it? And all these people, the Swissy and the, and the general in America, all became American citizens, you know? And then their children in the CIA, and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. And I'll show you in a minute, the idea was Swiss. Again, as always. You know, they're always in it somewhere. Believe me, people. And you can see, again, the Swiss Templars here working together with the nobility. Like the Second World War, uh, it's, it's always the same. So, in a letter from June 29th, 1763, the Swissy Merc, the mercenary, Colonel Henri Bouquet suggested the British commander-in-chief of North America, the Baron, the first Baron, Jeffrey Amherst, that he had a splendid idea in order to get rid of some hundred million Indians once and for all using biological warfare just as they're using that on the entire human race right now in 2022 and the english baron wrote back oh my dear chap from Swaziland, what a splendid idea you go do that, my dear Swiss Colonel Bouquet. So, here you see the Baron of Amherst. It's a lot of red and white, a lot of red, because that's where they come from, the, the red house of Pharaoh, the Pertasser. And then it has a little bit of white, where we are now. It has an octagon with red and white. And look at the long nose, these aristocrats. Now you don't see that any much, so much anymore because they've been so mixed. But in these days, on the old pictures, they got all these long pharaonic noses. So, you know, the, the, the big nose, as people say, it's, it's not the jaywalkers. You know, th th this is the typical long, they're long noses. You know, and they're nosy as well, you know, putting their long noses into our affairs, like, eh? And, um, I mean, this is not European, these long noses. You know. And, um, here it says, Amherst's legacy is controversial due to his, or oh, controversial, due to his expressed desire to exterminate the race of indigenous people during the Pontiac's War and his advocacy of biological warfare in the form of gifting blankets infected with smallpox as a weapon. And uh, so he was the commander in chief of North America, the crown governor of Virginia. He was serving under the second George and the third George. You remember what I told you about the state of Georgia? And the Saint George Guidestones. And here's the Earth of Lud Ludun, the Governor of 
of New France. So so he was a page to the Duke of Dorset. Yeah, set, set the door set, set as the uh, the lord of the underworld. It's not a um, it's not a coincidence, you know, all these pharaonic syllables in it. Yeah, North the Indian War in North America. Yeah. I'll read it for you. A month later, the use of smallpox blankets was discussed by Amherst himself in letters to Colonel Henri Bouquet. Amherst, having learned that smallpox had broken out, well, he learned it because of uh, Colonel Bouquet. It's the other way around, which uh, I'll show you that in a minute through the letters, had broken out amongst the garrison at Fort Pitt. And uh, so he wrote to Colonel Bouquet, could it not be contrived to send the smallpox among the uh, disaffected tribes of Indians? We must on this occasion use every stratagem in our power to reduce them. Bouquet, who was already marching to relieve Fort Pitt, agreed with this suggestion in a postscript where he responded to Amherst just days later on July 13, 1763. I will try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets that may fall in their hands, taking care, however, not to get the disease myself, as it is pity to oppose good men against them. I wish we could make use of the Spaniard's method and hunt them, hunt them with English dogs supported by rangers and some light horse who would I think effectively extirpate, extirpate or remove that vermine. In response, also in postscript, Amherst replied, hey, you will do that, you will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets as well as to try every other method that I can serve to extirpate this execrable race. I should be very glad your scheme for hunting them down with dogs could take effect. But England is at too great a distance to think of that at present. Well, this is what they did. You know, working together, the nobility and the Swiss Templars. It's always the same, and it's still going on like this, you know. There you are, octagon. Biological warfare. And these people and their descendants, they became American citizens, citizens, you know, Swiss and the nobility ruling America. So they uh, still have the, 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 uh, the letter, yeah, it says later, Derrico found a letter indicating Amherst was keen on the idea. So they have the letters. Uh, uh, they still have, the letters are still there by um, uh, the Baron. Amherst and by the uh, the Swiss mercenary colonel and Erico, he is uh, Peter Erico, is a uh, professor at the uh, Massachusetts University. I read it for you. Inoculate the Indians. Derico did find evidence of a plot to infect indigenous people. Um, in fact, the name Derico. It's also uh, the nobility, in fact. De Erico might be of French origin or Italian. Everything with de, it's uh, nobility. It's like von in German. So the first letter was from a Swiss mercenary. So you see, the very first letter uh, was Swiss, from a by a Swiss mercenary called Henri Bouquet, Henry Bouquet, who suggested giving out smallpox infected blankets to inoculate the Indians. So the very first letter it gave the um, 
the idea, the Swiss idea, uh, to genocide the um, the American Indians with smallpox. So it was a Swiss idea, indeed. Uh, later, Derrico found a letter indicating Amherst was keen on the idea. idea. Later on, the the Baron for hey, this is a nice idea. There was from Amherst himself to Bouquet saying this is a good idea uh, to spread smallpox. Just be careful you don't get it yourself, said uh, Derrico. So he actually says it. There was a good idea, the Baron. This is this is what he said. You will do you will do well to try to inoculate the Indians <laughs> by means of blankets as well as to try every other method that can serve to extirpate this execrable race. By Field Marshal Jeffrey Amherst, the first Baron Amherst. So how many are there? This is the first one then. And the text of Amherst's letters reads, You would do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as to try every other method that can serve to extirpate the execrable race. I should be very glad your scheme for hunting them down by dogs, eh, the Swiss idea to go and hunt them dogs, your scheme, take effect. But England is at too great a distance to think of that at present. Well, I know what it is, you know, in Switzerland to be hunted down by them dogs there, eh? That's what they did with me, eh? Derrico wrote in his study of Amherst that none of these other letters show a deranged mind or an obsession with cruelty. Amherst's venom was only directed or only at indigenous peoples, he added. Oh, so where's the problem, you know? Only some indigenous people, I mean, who cares, yeah? So, um, he was, uh, it, none, none of the letters showed a deranged mind. So, th this is the dangerous part, actually, because these people look so normal, and so neutral, and so clean, you know, the Swiss, the nobility. They've never done anything wrong, haven't they? Have they now, eh? Like um, Dr. Mengele, you know, he looks so normal, a doctor, an intelligent man, he even did his PhD, uh, a physician, you think, oh, he helps people, he looks nice, he doesn't look like, uh, like aggressive, and he acts normal, you know, like all serial killers do, right, you know, Th these are serial killers, these are psychopaths, you know, you don't see it, you know. They're neutral, they hide amongst us, and then and then they kill us all when the moment is right for it. Eh? That's the dangerous thing about it, you know. So, and here in the Wikipedia about Geoffrey Amherst, the first Baron of uh, Amherst, if I scroll down here into the, um, there's another picture of him. He even found himself a wife. Hmm. Here, legacy. Uh, here, look, there's so many places um, called after him. Amherst Burke in Ontario. The General Amherst High School in Ont Ontario. Yeah, Amherst in Massachusetts. Oh, that's why the professor talked about it. The whole university is called Amherst. Ah, oh, he's a big hero then, eh? Did a lot of good things, eh? University of Massachusetts. There's even an Indian in it. Oh, they're so proud of it. Hey, don't mind me. Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. So there's a town called Amherst. They were so glad with this guy. Eh? Amherst College, also in Massachusetts. Amherst in um, New Hampshire. Here another M in Nova Scotia. Amherst. 
Amherst, New York, uh, a town in state of New York, Amherst County in Virginia. So this is why the um, here the two, in 2008 a Micmac spiritual leader John Joe Sark, so an Indian, called the name of Fort Amherst Park of Prince Edward Island a terrible blotch on Canada, and said to have a place named after General Amherst would be like having a city, having that in the city of Jerusalem probably like having a square in Jerusalem named after Adolf Hitler. It's disgusting. And um, Sark raises concerns again in 2016 to a letter to the Canadian government and the Micmac historian Daniel Paul who referred to Amherst as motivated by white supremacist, supremacist beliefs. And this is the, th the, the sad thing about it, you know, it's the nobility, it's Swiss, and the whole white race, as usual, get, um, gets blamed of it, you know, everything. Because people don't understand, it's, it's Pharaoh, it's the Knights Templars, you know, and they did the same with the white people, with us. Uh, in the Middle Ages, we were the white race. We were slaves in a in a feudal system, and we still are. So it's it's so easy to say, you know, like the the white people did it, or or the jaywalkers did it, you know. Or, uh, it's so easy like this, but it goes so far much deeper. So so I mean, what's the use of the Indian medicine man and all the all these wizards if they can't even tell you what's really going on, eh? I mean, don't listen to the medicine man, I would say, eh? Uh, just listen to Homie Ross. <laughs> okay. The Swiss idea worked out really well and 100 million Indians got exterminated. Just like the Swiss Judenfrei of the Nazis, or free of humans on the entire globe coming up very soon in the near future. So this metal plate was screwed on every wall, on every, in every town or village that was uh, liberated from the jaywalkers when the last single one of them uh, was gone and here you see the rotary club wheel and the whole thing is in a circle for the compass and here is a square and here is a square so it says square and compass together with the rotary wheel because with a compass you can make a circle and as the earls of Amherst were so proud of this endeavor of the first Baron Jeffrey Amherst liberating the Americas from those uncivilized savages like just like the Nazi Lebensraum eliminating all the subhumans Untermensch that the Amherst nobility Proud, proudly put two Indians on their coat of arms celebrating Pharaoh's splendid victory over the indigenous adversary. Therefore you can see the smallpox blankets covering the entire crest with four balls of the concept of four meaning us the people being dominated by them who are depicted through the concept of three and three spares and a red underground for the Per Tasser red house of Pharaoh where the entire nobility originates from so here you see the blankets hanging over the whole thing. Uh, here's the concept of four. 
you know, the people are dominated, you know, through like exterminating them and whatever. And here, of course, this is vertically, like reminding us or them a reference to the vertical rule with a red underground for the Pertasser and um, the concept of three, which is them, the side of a pyramid, which is a triangle, which is them, the hierarchy of the, of the pyramid. And the concept of four is the base of a pyramid all the way down. That's us. And of those hundred million Indians, there were only two left, like sort of, you know, like in a manner of speaking. And those one or two that are left, they are chained, you know, so mm, there's no more danger, you know, they're unchained. Uh, here it says something with virtue. I can't read this one here. Well, it doesn't matter, you know, it's always the same thing. Charming chaps, aren't they? And here, Lord Amherst had succeeded his uncle, Geoffrey Amherst, the first baron. I hope they're not like 100 or 200. Well, probably now there are like 10,000 of them, you know, descendants. That was the first one. So we already know that one. The Geoffrey Amherst, there he is. The first baron. What a hero, eh? In 1797, the latter, so this one here, the latter uh, was a distinguished military commander. Wow. Best known as one of the victors of the French and Indian War. Wow, what a hero. In 1776, that was when America was made. He was raised to the peerage of Great Britain as Baron Amherst of Holmesdale in the county of Kent, with normal remainder to as male of his body. Yo, what a hero. There's no word about what he did, right? All the endeavors, how he fought the Indians and he almost got killed, like, you know. What a fantastic hero, you know. That's how he's depicted in the um, in the coat of arms, and this is how he goes into history. Aristocratic coat of arms are like reading comics, telling the whole story of and by our masters. Now here you can see the hero of the story, the first Baron of Amherst and his mercenary Swiss doing this to the Indians boom bow poof splash by using just one blanket and this is about Pontiac war they probably got their name from the car <laughs> and here uh, here he is, look. The policies of General Geoffrey Amherst, a British hero, it says, of the Seven Years' War, helped to provoke Pontiac's war. A British hero, can you believe it? Look, the British hero has a octagon, and he has a pharaonic sash in red for the Pertasser. The Red House of Pharaoh of Lower Egypt, where they all come from. And here's thinking, you know, oh, the Swiss had a good idea with that blanket. That's what he's thinking, eh? Uh, yeah, some more images here. Yeah, yeah the, um, a massacre on the women. Uh, the Swiss squaw killer, like uh, General Costa, he was called the squaw killer and he was Swiss. So, a little bit more down. Fort, Fort Pitt. Hey Brad, what are you doing there? 
Hmm. Okay. Uh, the British hero with a sash. So this is about the siege of Fort Pitt. Now look, Fort Pitt is a star fort. You see that? It's the one I filmed in France. A whole star city. So this is probably where they got the idea of the Pentagon from. Look at this. It's Pentagon. And uh, it's still about the affair, about the uh, biological warfare and the blankets. So this is here about Amherst letters. Letters between Amherst, Amherst and the Swiss bouquet. <coughs> General Amherst, July 8th. Could it not be contrived to send the smallpox amongst those disaffected tribes of Indians? Well, you can read it yourself. These are all letters which are still there, you know. It's, it's all retraced. And uh, a letter from July 19th, etc. And here they talk. Here, when Bouquet wrote to Écuyer, now who's Écuyer? That's a French name, just like Bouquet. So I guess that Bouquet, uh, from the French-speaking part of Switzerland, that Écuyer, he's also Swiss. It's full of Swiss. And um, I couldn't find it about the... Uh, uh, the fort uh, pit no equier so I had to go and look somewhere else oh, look there he is Captain Zimion Equier Swiss by birth and commander of the British garrison at Fort Pitt he was even the commander of Fort Pitt so how come he's not in the Wikipedia about Fort Pitt uh, so it's full of Swiss, all the officers, you know, it's all octagon, it's the aristocracy and the Swiss. And uh, the higher officers, they are, it's the nobility, and then the colonels and the captains, they are Swiss. Working for the nobility in this. Uh, apparently, Equier, the Swiss, he said, I see... Well, he said this here. He couldn't sleep anymore because uh, because of the Indians. Uh, not because they gave the um, they did the genocide. No, that's after that was no problem sleeping. Hey, eh? Swissy. The first Baron of Amherst, the Swiss Colonel Henri Bouquet. And the Swiss captain Equier, again another example of how the Swiss and the nobility work together, just as in organizing World War II, explained in my video here on the same channel called The Nobility World Wars, or the Order of the Garter, with on one side the lion. For the nobility and on the other side the unicorn for the Templars and their Swiss base. An image referring to their union and explained in this video here. So here this is referring to the Knights Templars and their Swiss base. This is referring to the nobility, the lion with the crown. In this video here, same channel, here's the title. And I remind you of yet some more Swiss mass murderers on 
Indians and Americans in the US of A, like the Swiss score killer General Costa in this video here on the channel Hatzefratz and here's the channel. Swiss US General Costa, the score killer, who Swiss cheesed Native American children in Indian genocide. I made it seven years ago. Another Swiss genocider, and who is probably having a lot of offspring in America today, probably working in the CIA and on all key positions. There are one million of them today, Swiss Americans. Or the Swiss captain Henry Wirtz, concentration camp commander on American soil, torturing and murdering many white Americans, whom you can see here lying on top of each other, like seeing Auschwitz. So the Swiss here, together with the, the nobility, doing the same thing on white Americans this time, just as they did on Indians, Koreans, Vietnamese, Muslims and whatnot. Swissy will never stop their endless genocides in union with Pharaoh's nobility. I made this also seven years ago on my channel Hatzefratz. Here's the title Swiss Death Camps in USA Helvetica Americana and the St. Louis Killer Cops from Switzerland. And here this video I made eight years ago still on Hatzefratz US POWs and MIAs, Swiss internees in Switzerland's concentration camp. So the Swiss, they had special concentration camps, three of them, during the Second World War to torture and murder American pilots. In Vauville Armos, uh, Les Diableries, and uh, there was another one, but you can see it in the video are like facts, and the facts show us that America has always practiced biological warfare on many peoples, wherever they go. So a crime profiler would say that to a 99% certainty the US are behind Pharaoh's bug, which is going at the moment. And as America is being ruled by the Swiss Octagon and Pharaoh's worldwide nobility, I'm 100% sure that the Swiss Novartis company are behind the Wu flu. And Novartis has a bug lab in China, in the Wu flu area. So this video is here on my channel Homeland Security and here's the title Swiss Novartis Files mm -hmm, mm -hmm, I can't pronounce this Connection Switzerland's Human Guinea Pigs Virus Experiments and they, they did guinea pigs experiments on Polish homeless with uh, 20, I think 25 people died and here you can read it here yeah. and this is the typical words being used in this part of the world. During the Korean War from 1950 to 1953 the US dropped infected insects over North Korea and China, which resulted in outbreaks of smallpox again, as smallpox seemed to be a popular weapon by the US Army. And there were sudden outbreaks of cholera, the plague and meningitis. All these virus outbreaks were very unusual just as what's happening today with the Wu flu pharaonic bug. Same story. 
And in fact, insects were found in 1951 in North Korea that carried these deadly viruses. The smallpox, cholera, the plague and meningitis. As the North Koreans had enough blankets of themselves, so they didn't have to give them just like they did to the Indians, then the United States Air Force emptied loads of infected insects over the indigenous population instead. Well, what was America doing there in the first place in a country far away, which is not theirs, aggressing on other people? Well, we all know that um, through the paperclip, the, uh, the Nazis uh, left uh, Germany and Europe and they came into the United States taking over key positions and all that. And they just continue to do what they do best, so to speak. I believe the Chinese. I mean, the proofs are all there. And um, yeah, the allegations. It has been proven now. Eh? So smallpox here. This has happened with the little Asian children. Uh, there was cholera here. Yeah. The, even the bubonic plague and meningitis all made in america made in usa in the very same year of 1951 the swiss octagon and their cia poisoned the entire french town of le pont saint esprit with swiss made lsd killing many people i visited le pont saint esprit in this video here on my channel Hatzafat, so this video here. The title is Remote Control Terrorists and CIA and all the rest. And also I made this video here, Le Pont Saint Esprit MK Ultra. Also about this town here. I had another video but it got a um, deleted uh, by the YouTube censorship. Here you can read in the 1951 Pont Saint-Esprit, it's, it's all from 1951, they were very active, even in America, in San Francisco. And um, here you can read about it, the mass poisoning, got poisoned with LSD in exactly the same time and the CIA was experimenting on LSD with LSD concerning the um, the MK Ultra brainwashing experiments, and even on their own people, the U.S. Army used biological weapons, thus killing many Americans which also happened in the year 1951. I guess 1951 was a busy bioweapon year for the US Army, Korea, France, San Francisco and what not. Now I'll read it for you. In 1950, so also 1951, the US released a bioweapon in San Francisco. This was one of hundreds of bioweapon simulations carried out in the 1950s and 1960s. This case of using bioweapons inside the US on American citizens has been officially confirmed by the US military. <laughs> they finally had to. So. It's clear who exactly is behind the other cases in Korea, France and China. December 2019, the Wu flu. The army code 
of the attack in San Francisco was Operation Sea Spray. When from 1950 to 1960 at 293 different places in the United States of America, the US Army released infected clouds of bacteria and viruses over entire American cities, killing many people and leaving hundreds of thousands very sick, like in 1950 in San Francisco. So here it says here how the US government tested biological warfare on America. Well, I'll let you read it. I just take out a couple of things here. Yeah, it says biological warfare, uh, warfare. But you better read everything, eh? The, uh, the film will get too long if I would. So I just punch pause in the film. So I just read you this part here. San Francisco's bacteria uh, fiasco. A confidential government report written in 1951. There we go again, 1951. Special Report Number 142 Biological Warfare Trials at San Francisco, California, to the 20th until 27th December, September 1950, maps out the details of the um, city's top secret bacteria bombing. Through the tests, officials sought to accomplish three objectives to study the offensive possibilities of attacking a seaport city with a biological warfare aerosol, to highlight the vul vulnerability of the country's defense against such attacks, and to gain data on how bacteria affected a population. So I mean, you know, if they try this out, 1950, on the, uh, even on their own citizens, of course they're going to use it, you know, and which they did in Korea in 1951 and in France 1951. Nowhere in the report was the welfare of San Franciscans mentioned. The tests proceeded without knowledge or consent from the public. On the 20th, just three days after the 49ers made their NFL debut, the US Army was deployed to San Francisco and began secretly showering the city with bacteria. Over a course of eight days, a ship puttered along the shoreline of the bay, releasing massive clouds of uh, of two different pathogens, both of which were supposedly non-pathogenic, yet realistic simulants that might be used in an attack. In total, six experimental warfare attacks were carried out, four with Bacillus globigii and two with Serratia marcescens. You know, Serratia, that's the word Sar in it, king. Just like the, the other Sarkov uh, um, bug, what we have now, and marcescens, it's mer for you know, a pyramid. Bacillus is ba. It's the sill when you, the, the soul when you're dead. It's, it's full of pharaonic words. So, Saratia marcescens, known for its blood red coloration, is one of two bacteria sprayed over San Francisco in 1950. The army blasted these chemicals in a 30 minute spurt, producing huge clouds up to two miles in length, then proceeded to collect and assess dozens of samples of various Collection spots across the city, as noted in the report, various aspects of each of the six tests were scrupulously monitored. The time, the temperature, the wind speed, the humidity, but the most important factor seemed to be brushed over, the well-being of the people being sprayed. The samples collected yielded counts that gave some indication of how much bacteria was being inhaled. According to Leonard Cole, author of the Biological Warfare book, Clouds of Secrecy, it was quite a bit. Nearly all of San Francisco received 500 particle minutes per liter. In other words, nearly 
every one of 800,000 people in San Francisco exposed to the cloud. Now, one million people got sick, people. 800,000 people in San Francisco exposed to the cloud at normal breathing rates, which is 10 liters per minute. Inhaled 5,000 5, or more particles per minute during the several hours that they remained airborne. Since the army's bacteria presented similar dosage patterns, he continues, San Francisco residents were inhaling millions of bacteria and particles every day during the week of the testing. San Francisco residents' safety was wholly brushed over in the report, which promptly concluded it's entirely feasible to attack a seaport city with biological warfare aerosol. Well, which they, of course, they did in uh, in Korea. Eh? There's a lot of coastline in Korea, and you can read here a lot of people started coughing and and they got sick. Even people died. Many people died. I mean, the uh, there's still the. Uh, Okay, so I'm looking for the, okay, here the aftermath. San Francisco's incident, oh, they call it an incident, was just one of 293 bacterial attacks staged by the United States government in America between 1950 and 1969. It was neither the most anus nor the deadliest. So one people, di one person died in San Francisco. And this was not the most heinous and not the most deadliest, uh, deadliest in America. Can you imagine? So in 1955, as an experiment, between brackets, the CIA sp sprayed whooping cough bacteria over Tampa Bay, Florida. Whooping cough cases in the area subsequently increased from 313 nine and one death in 1954 and 12 deaths in 1955. This is just tip of the iceberg. Eh? Probably hundreds of thousands of people died and they don't even talk about the homeless. But no hard evidence has ever surfaced linking the two incidents. Now, of course, no, it's the government. The government can't uh, condemn the government. Eh? In an infamous 1966 test, federal agents crushed light bulbs containing trillions of bacteria on the New York subway, exposing thousands of rush hour commuters. The government never followed up to see how many people fell ill. <laughs> Before a crowd at Fort Detrick in 1969, that's where they make all this stuff, oh. and so on and so forth. Hey. So who's behind the woo flu people? Are you going to believe what the media wants to make you believe eh, all the time? That the Chinese are building up their army, they're so dangerous and they do this crazy marching and don't believe the media people. If the media show a thing like this and the media lie, then just take the opposite of it. And then you get the truth. So the truth is China doesn't do these things. The history is telling you, and it, these are facts, 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 yeah? That the US government, so I don't say the Americans anymore because most of the American people are okay. They're more than okay. But they should stand up against this and don't believe all the fairy tales of the media and President Bush and President Biden and, and, and the rest of these puppeteers. The US government has no problems in testing and using bioweapons on Americans, eventually killing them under excruciating pains. Making it further clear who is behind the lethal poisoning of special FBI agent Tom O'Laughlin.
as the US government has confirmed to poison their own people with various bioweapons and cancer creating poisons. So here you see in the picture Tom O'Loughlin, Kennedy's man of the uh, Saxa detachment. And here again Kennedy's FBI man Tom O'Loughlin being TDY in the Pentagon trying to find the military connections responsible for the opium imports from Southeast Asia into the USA by the military and the CIA. So they poisoned the good man and they killed his boss in the White House too. In order for the Octogon to sell all the drugs from Southeast Asia, from South America and from Afghanistan, it needed a whole bunch of young and stupid consumers and a marketing strategy. Oh, the nobility's ever and ever increasing offspring could also get rich and parasite on it. So it needed propaganda with fun and laughter to open the mental door, with good music to open the mental door even broader, and with easy sex to open the physical and moral door in order to get the youth prepared both mentally and physically for extensive drugs consume and pay for the product which got known under the name of sex drugs and rock and roll of the hippie era a word Pharaoh's media and social engineering had already prepared, repeating it all the time. Back then, the daily narrative was Vietnam War, drugs and music. Today, 2022, the narrative is chaos, end times, the antidote and the bug war. This technique is called repetitive political indoctrination through PSYOP and social engineering. So the octagon of the Nazi Templars ordered their military industrial complex to have the drugs program executed and trap the people's youth using this wicked strategy because the drugs industry is an important branch of the military industrial complex. Therefore, the military industrial complex had their elite children taught various new musical instruments like electric guitars and electric pianos and set up all the recording studios in and around Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles, where all the military sons and daughters came and live as well in and around Laurel Canyon, and became the angels of death like the unseen Pied Piper. Therefore, the father of Jim Morrison of the Doors was a U.S. Navy Admiral who was there at the Tonkin Gulf accident, conveniently leading to the Vietnam War by the Octagon's Admiral George Stephen Morrison. By the way, his son the famous Jim Morrison of the Doors called himself the Lizard King and I can do anything. And you'll remember the half-open door I filmed 
in that creepy Templar commandery, which you can see in this video here on the same channel. The doors, with music and laughter, they open up your inner door and even your inner doors into drugs, abusive sex, addiction and satanic rituals. The doors. This is what they mean with it, the doors. Here's the title here on my channel, the same channel. So, here you can read it in Wikipedia. George Stephen Morrison, United States Navy, a rear admiral. I wonder what the front looks like. Eh? Gulf of Tonkin incident. He was the father of Jim Morrison. Oh, there he is. Well, the eyes are the same. Look at that. And I'll put it in the links for you in the description. Yeah, the personal life. Morrison met and married Clara Virginia Clark in Hawaii in 1942. Their son Jim Morrison, later lead singer of rock band The Doors, was born in late 1943 in Melbourne, Florida, where they lived at the time while stationed at Naval Air Station, uh, Melbourne. They also had a daughter, uh, and so forth. It's all the hippie movement, the music, it was all by the military industrial complex. Frank Zappa he once said, politics is the entertainment division of the military industrial complex. Well, how come a musician is saying these sort of things? You know, music and military industrial complex it doesn't really fit together, does it now? Well, that's because Frank Zappa's father was a chemical warfare specialist in the CIA's MK Ultra brainwashing program. So, you know, they feel so sure of themselves and also because humanity is really so stupid. You know, they, they can just rub it into our eyes, rub it into our faces. You know? They can say whatever they want and people will not wake up. Here, yeah, this is Wikipedia on Frank Zappa, which is an Italian, a Sicilian name. So, yeah. Childhood. Zappa was born on December 21st. Winter solstice, you know, the magic. 1940 in Baltimore, Maryland. His mother, Rose Marie, n uh, born Collymore was of Italian, uh, ne Napolitan and uh, Sicilian and French ancestry. His father, whose name was anglicized to Francis Vincent Zappa, was an immigrant from Partinico, Sicily, with Greek and Arab ancestry. Oh, you can see that, right? Frank, the eldest of four children, was raised in an Italian-American household where Italian was often spoken by his grandparents. The family moved often because his father, a chemist and mathematician, worked in the defense industry. After a time in Florida in 1940s, the family returned to Maryland, where Zappa's father worked at the Edgewood Arsenal Chemical Warfare. Wow, well, there we go, eh? Chemical Warfare. He was probably uh, also uh, in it, you know, doing the attack on uh, San Francisco and, and in France and Korea. And so the Edgewood Arsenal chemical warfare facility of the Aberdeen Proving Ground run by the US Army. Yeah, that's the same. 
due to their home's proximity to the arsenal, which stored mustard gas, gas masks were kept in the home in case of an accident. So, so you say his father is Sicilian. So here we are back to the mafia and CIA connection. Uh, it's, it's everywhere, you know. And they don't talk, of course, about the Alps and the Octagon. So here you can see um, Frank Zappa's father from Partinico, Sicily. Here's a picture. No, yes, it does. And um, so here you can see someone born in the land of the Mafia and uh, where the most Templar commanderies are in the world and who started to work for the CIA and the Octogon. This is not a coincidence, no, no. Frank Zappa's manager, Herb Cohen, was an ex-US Marine and he was in Africa's Congo working for the CIA somehow involved in the killing of the <coughs> Congo's leftist Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba. Here you can see Cohen was born in New York after a period in the army and he was the uh, the manager of Frank Zappa and, and the rest of them here. So he was not only a negotiator for the famous rock stars of the military industrial complex but here Herb Cohen he was also a um, negotiator for the Department of State, the FBI, the CIA and the US Department of Justice. Patrice Lumumbo and uh, he was killed in 1961. He has a good face. You know? the, the, the Octogon, they make sure they they murder all the good people. Especially presidents and John F. Kennedy and everything. Yeah. So <clears throat> the 2001 report by the Belgian Commission describes this is about the United States involvement. It describes previous US and Belgian plots to kill Lumumbu. Among them was a Central Intelligence Agency sponsored attempt to poison him. Right? You remember Tom O'Loughlin? They poison people. So this is a fact that they poison people, even their own people. And the US President Dwight Eisenhower, a Swiss Eisenhower, author authorized the assassination of Lumumba in 1960, however, the plot to poison him was abandoned. The CIA chemist S S Sidney Gottlieb, <laughs> Gottlieb, he says God loves him. It means God and love. What a name for a guy using poisons for the CIA. A key person in the plan devised a poison resembling a toothpaste. And in September 1960, Gottlieb brought a vial of the poison to the Congo, probably with the help of this uh, negotiator, Herb Cohen, negotiating for the rock groups and for the CIA, with plans to place it on Lumumba's toothbrush. The plot was abandoned al allegedly because Larry Deflin, CIA station chief for the Congo, refused permission. Um, well, and so on. I mean, the, the CIA is there, they are deep in it. In 1975, the church committee, or oh, was that? They're also in it. Uh -huh. 
went on record with the finding that CIA Chief Alan Dulles had ordered Lumumba's assassination as an urgent and prime objective. The committee later found that while the CIA had sponsored to kill Lumumba, it was not directly involved in the murder. Oh, really? Um, in 2013, you see, it's still going on. You know, it happened in 1961, and there's still not the end of it. The, because they hide it. All these government criminals, CIA and the Octagon, Switzerland, they hide things, you know. The US State Department admitted that President Eisenhower authorized the murder of Lumumba. However, documents released in 2017, I mean, this, this is five years ago, eh? revealed that an American role in Lumumba's murder was only under consideration by the CIA. CIA Chief Alan Dulles had allocated $100,000, which was a lot more in those days, to accomplish the act. Well, deeply involved in it. It's the octagon, they use everything, the mafia, the hippie movement, it's all one, one thing. Frank Zappa's wife, Gail Zappa, maiden name Adelaide Slotman, was together with Jim Morrison in kindergarten, and her father, from a long line of U.S. naval officers, was a nuclear weapons researcher in the U.S. Navy. It says in Wikipedia, so this is Gail Zappa. You know, they're all one big family. All pharaohs. All their parents are uh, high officers, admirals and generals. Adelaide Gail Slotman, here, early life, was born in Philadelphia to John Klein Slotman. Klein, it means small. A German or a Swiss German name. Who was a second generation German American and nuclear physicist with the United States Navy. And Laura Freitas was born in Honolulu of Portuguese ancestry. That's probably the mother. So he was a nuclear physicist in the United States Navy. I mean, that's not nothing. Eh? That's these are high officers and and in in MK Ultra nuclear physicists, etc. Uh, so he was second generation. Okay. Yeah, this is in Laurel Canyon, Gail Zappa. So she died and born Adelaide Gail Slotman in 1945. She grew up in California and reportedly attended kindergarten with Jim Morrison of the Doors. Her father, who was a nuclear weapons researcher, relocated the family to London during her teenage years. There she is, or there she was. John Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas. His father was the U.S. Marine Captain Claude Andrew Phillips of the Military Intelligence Complex. So here you see the Mamas and the Papas, the music group from the hippie era, and the And here we'll see his father, early life. Philip uh, was Phillips was born August 30, 1935, in Paris Island, South Carolina. His father, Claude Andrew Phillips, was a retired United States Marine Corps officer, and who later went into the military intelligence complex. 
and Phillips he even went to the United States Naval Academy. Oh, look at this. It has uh, two times the um, the fatches, you know, the whole bundle together. It means uh, where we go one, we go all. <laughs> Let's keep it in America then, eh? And um, so how come all these musicians, I mean, music is about love. They were singing about love. How come they were all in military academies? The fathers were generals and admirals. How come, eh? Well, this is octagon. They they do they they use any means you know to get money to parasite on us to influence us to manipulate us and to rule the world. I mean, in a way, they ruled the world with music in these years. It, it influenced billions of people and still does. It's uh, all in the names, like the doors, as I've shown you before, of the Templar commandery, those doors, and the mamas and the papas, because all the 60s musicians, their mamas and papas, were in the military. Otherwise, it's quite a strange name for a pop band, huh? Especially in this era where they were rather advocating uh, not to make any children at all, you know? And to have free sex, have fun all your life, and the worst thing that can happen to you is um, have a baby. So, you know, why the mamas and the papas? Well, because they were making children, only the rest of us didn't anymore. It's all a setup. John Phillips' wife, Susie Adams, and sister Rosie, so Rosie Phillips, the sister of John Phillips, they both worked in the Pentagon. And Susie Adams was a descendant of US President John Adams. Now they're all one family. <laughs> and they sing for us. Wow. Enough charming ladies in the Pentagon to offer FBI agent Thomas O'Loughlin a poisoned cup of coffee filled with cancer provoking agents in it with Frank Zappa's father, a chemical warfare specialist. Now, remember the Octagon members of this conspiracy all had their children living in Laurel Canyon. So they all knew each other, including the parents who had set it all up in the first place. Those mamas and papas, right? So apparently this is um, John Phillips. And this here is uh, the military connection. And after leaving Annapolis, so it's about John Phillips. This is John Phillips, yeah. After leaving Annapolis, John married Susie Adams, you know, working for the Pentagon and a descendant of a, a, a U.S. president. A direct descendant of the founding father, John Adams. Susie's father, James Adams Jr., had been involved in what Susie described as cloak and dagger stuff with the Air Force in Vienna. Was that Vienna, Austria? Or what we like to call covered intelligence operations. Susie herself would later find employment at the Pentagon. Well, of course, her father found her a job. Huh? Alongside John Phillips' older sister, Rosie, also got a job in the Pentagon. It's just one family. It's like Working in a pizza restaurant. Oh, yeah, I've got a brother, you know, a small brother. Can, he can cut up the pizzas or the, he cut up the tomatoes, yeah? Who put these guys, they cut up something, something else was his uh, red. Who dutifully reported to work at the complex for nearly 30 years. So you, so you see, you know, that the sister of John Adams, of the mamas and the papas, and these papas and mamas all working for the military industrial complex, she worked 30 years for the Pentagon. And, and, and you believe it when they're singing about love. Come on, people. 
John's mother, Dean Phillips, also worked for most of her life for the federal government in some unspecified capacity. And John's older brother, Tommy, was a battle scout former U.S. Marine who found work as a cop on the Alexandria Police Force, albeit one with a disciplinary record for exhibiting a violent streak when dealing with people of color. Oh, a charming family, isn't it? Here, just some more about naval station here. Well, they made nice music. I mean, otherwise they couldn't have sold it, you know, the whole program. This is Mackenzie Phillips, probably his sister or his wife. These are the, uh, this is the, uh, the Pentagon girls, eh? Wow. Did Special Agent O'Loughlin find out something too much, like the Pentagon setting up the hippie movement, since he was TDY working at the Pentagon with a special assignment to investigate the connection between the drugs trade and the military industrial complex. Now, you be a good boy, Mr. Olaf Lynn and drink up your coffee while it's still warm. You're in the Pentagon, Mr. Olaf Lynn, so you don't have to worry. All the doors are closed and guarded. Saksa meaning Special Assistant for Counterintelligence and Special Activities. When does a soldier become expandable, eh? Well, if so, you just invite him for a cup of coffee, the so-called Judas cup. So, this is uh, Mama Cass Elliot, another singer of the Mamas and the Papas. And... Um, she was born Ellen Naomi Cohen, just like the other Herb Cohen, the CIA guy and manager of Frank Zappa. Across Mama Cass Elliot's home were murdered Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frykowski by the Manson family, is what they say. John spent time in Havana, so John Phillips of the Mamas and the Papas, in the era of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So there's a lot of peculiar coincidences in all this hippie era with fathers and mothers of the military industrial complex. It's too many. It's, it's all related to war, MK Ultra, blood, and Alan Naomi. Cohen was born in Baltimore, Maryland, in 1941, the doctor of Bess Ney Levine and Philip Cohen. All four of her grandparents were Russian jaywalker immigrants. And she died very young. Her death. Uh, Um, that night, Elliot, aged 32, died in her sleep at the London flat where she was staying. A heart failure. You know, the, the death was the, the autopsy. The forensic pathologist he said it was a heart failure. A typical CIA stuff. Eh? Maybe she, f she got remorse. And four years later, the Who's drummer, Keith Moon, died in the same room. And he was also 32. It's so many unbelievable coincidences. And every time there's a connection with the army. And death and murder. Just look at this hippie symbol popping up 
all over, all of a sudden and seemingly out of nowhere, but heavily boosted by Pharaoh's media. This so-called peace symbol does not stand for peace at all, but it means square and compass. We Freemasons have it all under control. The circle represents the compass and concept of three, because with a compass one makes a circle, and inside the circle is a 90 degree square and concept of four. We are the concept of four and trapped by them inside the concept of three. The square is inside the circle, and the square is divided into two parts for male and female in this hippie era of sexual equality revolution. So here, this is exactly 90 degrees. So when you see 90 degrees and they say, well, you know enough, you know? And there's the circle for the compass. So we are the concept of four, the square, and we're trapped in the circle, male and female, all together, and they're equal. The parts are equal for male and female. Stefan Stills of um, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young was raised at US military bases in Central America. And he had a song called Bluebird, as in the MK, MK Ultra program, Bluebird. And it says, mind control programs by the CIA. And they started with Project Bluebird in 1951. There we are again, 1951, oh, very busy. And they still are people. There he is, Stefan Stills, the famous musician. He looks a bit like uh, Alex Jones. And here is song Bluebird, number seven. Another one of their coincidences. And here in Wikipedia, Stefan Stills. And, uh, oh, he's got a French wife, Véronique Sanson. Hmm. He's a so-called political activist. I oh, forget it. Mm. Um, here, the early years. Stills was born in Dallas, and he was raised in a military family. It says he moved around as a child and developed an interest. He was also influenced by Latin music and. Uh, Spending his youth, yeah, spending his youth in Costa Rica, the Panama Canal Zone, and he attended the Admiral Farragut Academy. What was that? Military Academy. Another one. David Crosby's father was Major Floyd Delafield Crosby of the Military Intelligence and Annapolis Naval Academy graduates. The Crosby family produced U.S. Senators, Congressmen, Governors, Mayors, Judges, Civil War Generals, Declaration of Independence signers, and if America had royalty, he would be a duke or a prince. And well, as I've proven you now, America is still being ruled by the nobility. So here you can see the singer, very famous, David Crosby, he's a bit older. And his father was a relative of the Van Rensselaer family and uh, a descendant and his mother, granddaughter of Bishop of Pittsburgh, Cortland Whitehead, descended from the prominent 
Van Cortland family. And here, if you look at the Rensselaer family, you see a coat of arms, you know, with three crowns, uh, three octagon stars. There's a Swiss cross or a Maltese cross. And there are three uh, Templar V's. Three and three is, of course, the, um, the concept of three, which is them. And in the sort of castle thing like here there's the concept of four on top and the concept of three below well if you look at it in white it's the concept of three on top which is them and the concept of four below but if you look at, at it in red it's the other way around altogether making seven and it says here his father was the uh, was a filmmaker Floyd Crosby here yeah. so he was also in the propaganda business and uh, to change our heads so here's his father Floyd Delafield Crosby a major ASC filmmakers and he was the father of the musician David Crosby there you go and um, the Rensselaer family the nobility this is about his career he did a lot of movies Hollywood movies so he's definitely part of the uh, social engineering I mean it, it changed humanity all these Hollywood films right? and uh, he, um, he was in the US Army Air Corps being making videos and flight training films in World War II and this is of course quite near to the uh, th this is social engineering this is uh, um, also used for intelligence you know video making and filming uh, enemy positions and all that major again the military industrial complex and the hippie movement and the hippie music of the 60s it was it was a very big industry and so it's part of the military industrial complex the mu musician jackson brown was born in a military hospital in Heidelberg, Germany, and his father was in the OSS and precursor of the CIA. So here's the famous musician. They're all pictures showing them a little bit older. And here you can see. So Brown was born. Uh, in 1948 in Heidelberg Germany so if there's an American you know like getting born in Germany you know you know there's this military family eh? where his father Clyde Jack Brown an American serviceman was stationed for his job assignment with the Stars and Stripes newspaper so that's of course it's uh, propaganda and it's and it's very near it would be a good uh, camouflage for an agent you know to work at the stars and stripes and of course it's difficult to find the proof of that he was in the OSS and his sister Burby Brown was born in Nuremberg and guess who also came from Nuremberg another famous American also in of the entertainment industry where they do the social engineering on the minds of our children um, uh, from another military family oh look there she is Sandra Bullock they're all from the military industrial complex in the entertainment industry whether it be music or Hollywood films and early life yeah she was born 1964 and her father 
was in charge of the army army's military postal service in Europe uh, was stationed in Nuremberg yeah. just as where the sister of um, Jackson Brown where she was born probably in the same at the same time right? when he met her mother her parents married in Germany a Bullock's maternal grandfather was a German rocket scientist from Nuremberg oh talking about the paperclip uh, projects project paperclip the family returned to Arlington where her father worked with the Army Material Command mm. Mm. All key positions, you know, Army Material Command is a key position, Army's Military Postal Service is, and you all remember where the World Postal Service are, they're in Bern, Switzerland. I made a video about that in my channel, Hatzefatz. Before becoming a contractor for the Pentagon. So he, he, he became a contractor for the Pentagon and for those who don't know what a contractor is a contractor has made a contract you know for a certain period so he's not really living in working for the pentagon but you know if he gets killed somewhere in the world like there were a lot of contractors in um, former special forces like in iraq and afghanistan they got higher, 10 times higher wages than a normal soldier. But they are expendable, you know, and it's, it's not, it doesn't make any political uh, scandals in the newspapers like there's an American soldier killed because they are no American soldiers. They are a contractor. The Russians, they use them as well in, in the genocide almost on the Chechen people. In Russian, they call them kontraktniki. They were the worst and the Russians even killers and all that they they took them out of of prisons so they could go and continue to kill children and women in Chechnya that was Mr. Putin behind this he's a very dangerous man Mr. Putin he's not as nice you know as he looks like with you know telling all his jokes and all that He's behind uh, killing uh, many, many, many children and women in Chechnya look, using the, uh, the Kontraktniki. So he was a contractor, he says, contractor for the Pentagon. So it means he was a Pentagon assassin. I mean, that's it. A contractor is an assassin. So again, Sandra Bullock, also military industrial complex. There's a link to Nuremberg. She lived yeah, for 12 years. Bullock was raised in Nuremberg and grew up speaking German. She speaks uh, perfect German. And she was in the Steiner School, the, the Waldorf School, just as my children were in. Jerry Backley of the band America, America. His father was the commander of the United States Air Force Base Ruslip near London in England where he met the other band members Dan Peek and Dewey Burnell who were of course also sons of career Air Force officers. Oh, no wonder they called the band America. Huh? It's all propaganda. Look, already in these days they're doing the uh, the devil's horns. See? Already back then. There he is, Jerry Beckley, born in 1952. And a founding member of the band America. There they are. And... An American father and an English mother and in 1967 Beckley's father became the commander of the United States Air Force Base at West Ruslip so that's I mean that's a high grade yeah 
at least you'll be a colonel to be a, usually a colonel to be the commander of a of a base so they're all all their fathers all high officers admirals generals uh, cia oss uh, army intelligence even the commander of of a united states air force base so where this guy grew up and where of course he met the other members of the group and um, so it's all this is all part of the octagon michael nasmith of the monkeys inherited the family fortune of 25 million dollars and he served in the u.s air force so that's him maybe you remember the monkeys Hey, hey, I'm the monkeys. <laughs> so, here it says he enlisted in the U.S. Air Force and a complete basic training at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. Was trained as an aircraft mechanic at Shepard Air Force Base in Wichita Falls. I was permanently stationed at the Sherman Air Force Base near a Burns Flat in Oklahoma. The band name, the Monkeys. Remember what I told you about Planet of the Apes in my brachycephalic cran craniometry film. Here's the title. And this is the channel. Why the name the monkeys? It's a bit strange, isn't it? Well, as a group or a person, you don't want to be referred to as being a monkey, do you know? So, well, you see, there are four of them for the concept of four, and he's holding up three fingers, him as well. So it does say the concept of three and the concept of four, and it says square and compass. Graham Parsons of the Flying Burrito Brothers, his father was Air Force Major Cecil Ingram, nicknamed Coon Dog. Uh, here he is, Graham Parsons, uh, the musicians, the musician. They were all the heroes of the 60s and the 70s and yeah, the Flying Burrito Brothers. And, yeah, Graham's father, Ingram Connor II, was a famous World War II flying ace decorated with the Air Medal, who was present at the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. Yeah, his name was Coon Dog. The name of the band is a reference to the Templar fraternity here, flying for the Air Force, like the Flying Brothers or the Flying Fraternity. So, in fact, Americans sing about love and peace and simultaneously murder millions all over the world. They even call it Vietnam War music, the sound of a murderous nation. Jimi Hendrix was a paratrooper of the 101st US Airborne. He died at 27, so he belongs to the club of seven, 27. And he would have probably lived longer if he would have stayed in the regular army as a regular soldier instead of becoming a music soldier for them there he is and so this is wikipedia and here it says military service uh, he was in the 101st airborne division at fort campbell Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison 
were both great fans of Aleister Crowley, the English Satanist who had a temple in Sicily. Alan Wilson of Canned Heat died at 27 together with the others of the club of 27 and all of them related to Laurel Canyon, the Pentagon setup. So here you can see him, Alan Wilson of the band uh, Canned Heat. There they are playing. And here it says he died at 27. Why did they all die at 27? And there is a reason for that, which I will explain to you. Well, because the 27th degree in Scottish Rite Freemasonry is being symbolized by a pentagram. The thing Satanists use, the 27th degree's name is the Night of the Sun. Therefore, 60s songs like the House of the Rising Sun. And it's here where all the higher degrees start, which all have Templar symbols, starting with the 28th Nine Knight Commander of the temple. It is therefore here one can see that Freemasonry comes out of the Knights Templars who still rule over Freemasonry which is in fact still a military order. Therefore all the death at 27 because the 27th degree, where the military degrees start, stands for the Pentagon, or a pentagram, who are behind the 60s hippie era of sex, drugs and rock and roll. Circle closed. We can all see this thing is pentagonal. Five penta, it means five in Greek, so there are five corners, one, two, three, four, five sides. And this is where the whole hippie era music, start, music era, uh, where it came from. And that's why you almost see the hippie symbol here, except these two here don't belong to it. But this here, it's exactly the hippie symbol here. You know, this is a square here, and instead of with these ones here, there's a circle. You know, that, this is where they took it from, right? the hippie symbol. Because it says square, and here's a compass, you know, where they walk around just like in Mecca or whatever, you know. You see, you see them almost, you, know, you see the persons walking around here, and this looks like a black cube almost. You know, so they're, they're too many references, you know, you know, where it all comes from. And I can guarantee you that this is it. You know. Pentagonal, just like it's 27th degree in uh, Freemasonry. And here you can see, if you take these, that and that away, you see the hippie symbol here. Not a coincidence, people. They always leave a sign or a symbol or a reference somewhere they, they they just you know it's too strong for them you know they just have to do it it's it's com it's you know it's compulsory it's compulsive you know so this is what we saw inside the pentagon i mean this symbol is integrated inside the the court of the pentagon only there's one more lane here one more here and this is pentagonal but there is a circle inside, but this is definitely in there. And why does it always have to be a Volkswagen? You know, it's a Nazi car developed by the Nazis. It means das Volk, ein Wagen für das Volk. It's a, it's a car for the people. Why always Volkswagen? Well, paperclip, people, the Nazis won the war. And they took over the Pentagon. 
The Swiss Octagon Rules Over Pentagon. I made a film about it with this title, a long film. But YouTube took it off. It was on my channel Gure. Too bad. So here once more. This is the Pentagon in the United States. So it's the arrows going to number 27, the Night of the Sun, the House of the Rising Sun. So from here on it's rising here. And they're all Templar symbols. This is the House of the Rising Sun, number 27. And this is interesting here. It says Noah Kite of Prus Prussian Night. You remember the brachycephalic skull form of the Prussians. And this is because of the Teutonic Knights. Because the Teutonic Knights uh, area, it became Prussia. With the same sort of Swiss uh, military mentality. And just have a good look at these ones here. You now he has a double-headed eagle here. A double birdie. And here's sort of a, a crown on it. But have a good look at this. And these, and this, and this, and this. Because I'm going to show that to you now. So there are like four T's. One, two, three, four. And here as well. Just remind you of this. So this is why they all died at 27. And I'm not sure if they died. or And if they died, if they did die. It was a, um, a satanic ritual related to the Knights Templars and the Freemasons. So above the Pentagon, that's why they chose the name Pentagon for the US military. They're all military grades here. And below it's more esoteric stuff here. You know, with the key and the key to wisdom and you know, the square, the, the compass here triangles but from from the pentagon upwards it becomes all military because the Maltese order and some Knights Templars and Teutonic Knights orders they have this symbol as well. Just remind you I'm going to show it to you now. So as we are closing the circle we are back in Sicily with the Kingdom of Two Sicilies and this is their coat of arms. And here you see this symbol in it, which I asked you to remember. So we're back, you know, Jim Morrison and uh, Alistair Crowley and Jimi Hendrix, all believing in this. And um, so we're back in Sicily and by closing the circle. And they've got some more. This is all the, the kingdom of two Sicilies, but then in a different place, you know. This is Naples here, and this is uh, Regno di Sicilia. Um, but it's this I wanted to show you. Here, there we are. Well, of course, here's an octagon, which is. The Kingdom of Two Sicilies, Contado di Molise. So it's it's you know for each province they have a different one. And the big one it's it combines them all. So here's that symbol, you know. The twenty uh, the twenty eighth grade. And of course this is a square. So now we are back closing the circle. We're back in Sicily and where Alistair Crowley had his temple, the Knights Templars, which is the Pentagon, the Nazi Templars, Octagon, and Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison, uh, believing in Alistair Crowley, who was in Sicily and who died at the age of seven, 27, which is the Pentagon. So we're all getting back to this, um, this symbol here with the four T's, or the Tau symbol actually. It, there's nothing which is a coincidence. Absolutely nothing. Singer Phil Ox did Staunton Military Academy and it has been said that he was CIA. Here, Phil Ox. There he is, a musician. 
and here it shows from 1956 to 1958 Ox was a student at the Staunton Military Academy in rural, rural Virginia uh, so it looks like it you know either by their parents or on a in a naval academy or being in the army they get discovered as musicians so they they get drafted by the Pentagon to become music soldiers I guess that's what happened so his father his father Jack was drafted in the army in World War II where he treated soldiers the Battle of the Bulge but okay that's I mean many more people had to go into the war but this guy went freely to a to the Staunton Military Academy where of course they have a good look at the um, at their students how they can use them um, and if they have music in this this era when they had musical abilities or talents uh, it opened all the way by the Pentagon but they made him die at 27 the Pentagon the 27 Pentagon there were additionally to this all many curious death around Laurel Canyon which of course I can't tell you all but quite a lot apparently a lot of sacrifices going on the father of actor Peter Fonda was a decorated US naval intelligence officer d during World War II and when Peter was 10 his mother Frances Ford Seymour was found dead with a sliced throat then eight months later father Frank married again to Susan Blanchard for just a year to dump her for the Italian countess of Dera Franchetti a consultant of Italian dictator Mussolini called Il Duce meaning the Duke well, that goes well together with a uh, with the countenance of Dera Franchetti. So, here about early life. Here it says uh, Henry Fonda and his wife Frances Ford Seymour. They say their mo their mother committed suicide. They don't say about the sliced throat. Well, I don't think a woman would commit suicide with this you know by slicing her throat and um, they found her nobody knows that it was a suicide okay that's the internet so here's his father and he made videos or films like Jezebel well you need a certain knowledge you know to make a video a film a Hollywood film called Jezebel because Jezebel is a demon it's called the sex demon like this guy here you know marrying one woman after the other going for the counters and mm, his wives being found with a sliced throat all these things uh, Jezebel, Je Jezebel actually does and you can see where he was in the United States Navy ah oh, here he was later commissioned as a lieutenant junior grade grade in air combat intelligence so you see he was in the naval intelligence after being discharged from active duty due to an overage in rank Fonda was transferred to the naval reserve serving another three years another one they're all in in the naval intelligence being admirals generals it's very suspicious so this is still Wikipedia of Henry Fonda here the uh, the father of Peter Fonda 
And later in 1950, Fonda married Susan Blanchard, his mistress. She was 21 years old. And then, and then she dumped her, which is in here as well. And in 1957, Fonda married the Italian Baroness of Dera Franchetti. Or Franchetti. I don't know how to say this. There. Uh, Abdera Franchetti, born uh, July 8, 1931, is an Italian baroness, descendant from, from an old Jay Walker family of Venice, which intermarried with the Rothschild family and who eventually converted to Roman Catholicism. She's most famous for being the fourth wife of American actor Henry Fonda. So, you see, there is Jay Walker nobility. You know? I mean, all peoples have nobility and they're all pharaohs. And she was apparently the... Um, a, um, a consultant of the Italian dictator uh, Mussolini. And remember how the Swiss made Mussolini who lived two years in Switzerland before the war, where the Swiss taught him and making all the context there in the motherland of it all. So there's a picture of him, Mussolini. And here he emigrates into Switzerland. 1902, Mussolini, he emigrated to Switzerland and he was in Fribourg, Brun. He was a stonemason. Well, I guess he was also another sort of a mason. Eh? Uh, he even met Vladimir Lenin. Look at that. He was also in Switzerland for, I think, for 20 years at least. They all were. And, uh, well, you can read it yourself. This is the base of it all. Eh? They own the Pentagon. The father of actor Dennis Hopper was in the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, in Burma, China and India during World War II. So here's Wikipedia, Dennis Hopper. There he is, Mr. Hopper. And this is about his father here. And his uh, James Millet Hopper was his father, and his father was a post office manager, having pre previously served in the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the Central Intelligence Agency in World War II in China and in in Burma. So, and it's quite possible that after the war he was still working for the CIA as well, which is what they normally do. Sharon Tate here, the wife of the Polish jaywalker pedophile Roman Polanski, got murdered by the Manson family and her father was Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tate of the US Army Intelligence. So here's Sharon Tate, Shar On, Sar it means the king and On it means um, Osiris. Uh, there she is. Or oh, there she was. And here it says uh, Sharon Tate was born on January 24th, 1943. Texas, the eldest of three daughters to Colonel Paul James Tate, a United States Army officer, and his wife Doris Gwendolyn, nay, uh, born Willet. The family of English, Scottish, Swiss, French, and Swiss German descent. Well, maybe that's why Polanski, the pedophile, is hiding in Switzerland. I went filming and I, I, I rang at the door. It's in my channel, Gatsefrats. You can look it up. 
and uh, yeah, that's probably why he's hiding there. He's a convicted pedophile, by the way. Convicted and all. Paul Tate, he's 82 now, or that was at least in uh, 20, 2005. A former army intelligence officer who went undercover seeking close to the murder of daughter Sharon Tate by the followers of Charles Manson died of congestive heart failure Wednesday at a convalescent home in Coopville, Washington. Sharon Tate was among five people killed at her Benedict Canyon estate, oh, we all know, and she was married to director Roman Polanski. So he was a former army intelligence officer, Paul Tate, the father of Sharon Tate. Again, another one, the papas and the mamas. Singer Emmylou Harris, her father, was a U.S. Marine Corps officer living next to the Woodbridge Army Research and Development Laboratories. Here's Emmylou Harris, there she is with a big guitar. And here it says, Harris is from a career military family. Her father, Walter, Walter Rut Rutland Harris, was a Marine Corps officer and her mother, Eugenia, was a wartime military wife. Her father was reported missing in action in Korea in 1952 and spent 10 months as a prisoner of war. Born in Birmingham, Alabama, Harris spent her childhood in North Carolina and Woodbridge. So in Woodbridge, was the Army Research and Development Laboratories. Singer John Denver, real name Henry John Deutschendorf, which is a German name, Deutsch, it means German, and Dorf, it means a village, a German village. So John Denver, his father, was a career U.S. Air Force officer at the famous Roswell Air Base. Well, we all know about the aliens at Roswell. John Denver, there he is. And here it's the early life. Henry John Deutschendorf Jr. was born on December 31, 1943 in Roswell, New Mexico to Captain Henry John Dutch Deutschendorf, a United States Army Air Force pilot. So he must have been an officer. You're not a you're not a pilot if you're not an officer, at Roswell Army Airfield and his wife Emma Louise Ney Swope. And he spent his youth in a lot of Air Force bases like this one. Oh, they all look like little toys, all the airplanes. Uh, oh, he was a singer here. And the Maxwell Air Force Base. Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth and uh, so you know enough time and place you know to to get discovered discovered by the um, by the headset for their 60 music uh, project the town of Denver in Colorado was settled by Swiss immigrants. Denver, as in John Denver. And here are some more, you can see some more towns here that are even Lucerne Valley. And these are Swiss Americans by percentage of the total population. Like in New Bern, 30% here, 30% of the population are Swiss. And, uh, and this one here, Swiss Americans by numbers, there are 8,000 in New York. And uh, 117,000 in California. Well, I'll show you the bigger picture in a minute. 
So this is the Swiss Americans website from Wikipedia. And you see there are 1 million Swiss Americans in the US. That's 0.28% uh, uh, of the US population. But they all go for all the key positions. So this is interesting. Uh, here's the history about it. You know, the Theobald von Erlach, you know, it's the nobility from Bern. I probably didn't like it very much, and I was in Bern when I started talking about that, right? And there's also von Grafenried. Well, they're not even in it. They should be. And, yeah, in California, there are 117,000. Swiss Americans, Pennsylvania 73,000. I guess there are more Swiss Americans or Swiss in the United States than there are jaywalkers. And I've shown you they, they have taken over far many more key positions than the jaywalkers did. I don't know of any jaywalker president. Eh? But I already mentioned three or four of them who are Swiss. So, facts, people, facts. Community settled by Swiss immigrants. There's a lot of Burns in Burnville. Uh, Swiss American historical societies. And, uh, of course, the Mennonites. Notable people. Uh, so, for a more comprehensive list, see list of Swiss Americans. Okay, well, let's have a look. List of Swiss Americans. And uh, there's a lot of actors. What is it? Oh, Robert Downey, Downey Jr., mothers of Swiss descent, James Caviezel also, paternal grandfather, even Jeff Bridges, wow, Yul Brunner, well, I knew that, well, his name is Swiss, you know, Brunner, Brunner, and uh, Meryl Streep, of course, René Zellweger, which is a... Uh, a Swiss name. Writers, musicians. Ian Le Leon Botstein. So this is Steinzi, who is Swiss. <laughs> yeah, governors and presidents. Herbert Hoover, Eisenhower, Obama. So I already got three who are Swiss. Eh? I don't know any Jay Walker presidents in the US. I don't know. I don't think there were any. So Herbert Hoover here. Uh, Swiss. His real name, Huber. Um, J. Edgar Hoover. Swiss. Yeah. Henri Bouquet. Oh, I just. And Henry Wirtz. Yeah. The Confederate soldier executed for war crimes and a prominent Henri Bouguet, a prominent army officer in the French and Indian War and the Pontiac's War. <clears throat> of course religion, scientists, Albert Einstein, yeah, well, not really Swiss, eh? he was born in Germany. He just lived in Switzerland. Rickenbacker, <laughs> the guitar. And of course, um, Chevrolet. That's, he was Swiss. I don't see him. No Chevrolet. Sports here. Ah, oh, here. Ah, oh, he's under sports. Louis Chevrolet. Oh, he was Swiss. 
Bobby Fischer. Ah, oh, I didn't know that. Well, etc., etc. Nancy Ross was the girlfriend of singer David Crosby. She had a child with Graham Persons and her father was a captain in the RAF, the Royal Air Force. And she finally married the grandson of Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt the same family as the president. The Swiss were selling a lot of their Swiss made and Swiss invented LSD in these 60s days. And one of their LSD distributors was Augustus Owsley Stanley III, whose father was a World War II military officer and he became a government attorney in Washington DC and his grandfather was the governor of Kentucky. So here he is in a hippie suit like uh, Indian stuff that, was, that became quite popular as well and um, he was the main drug dealer. He produced at least 500 grams of LSD amounting to a little more than 5 million doses and you know it's it's the elite behind this it's octagon the fathers are all high military officers generals admirals grandfathers are you know governors and senators here yeah. <clears throat> his father was a government attorney. He was Stanley was the scion of a political family from Kentucky. His grandfather Owsley Stanley, a member of the United States Senate, after serving as governor of Kentucky, and he was in the House of Representatives and campaigned against the pro prohibition. Oh, that's funny. should have been more in favor of it because you know the elites were making a lot of money in these times together with the mafia so the elite made the prohibition and their mafia made all the money yeah and here early life belying his darth of formal education he secured a position as a test engineer with rocketdyne in los angeles in his capacity, he worked on the SM-64 Navajo supersonic cruise missile. And in June 1956, he enlisted in the United States Air Force. So the drug dealer as well, he was in the United States Air Force. It's all Pentagon, Octagon, the military industrial complex behind it as an electronics specialist serving for 18 months including stints of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Okay. And also in California. And Edwards Air Force Base. Rocket engine test facility before being discharged in 1958. During his service, he secured an amateur radio license and general radio telephone operator license. I tell you people, we don't even know half of it, how deep it all goes. And all these military people, you know, the head shed, they push our youth into drugs and into wars with some nice and fine music. So they all follow the Pied Piper. Yeah, here's a sign when you enter the town. So Augustus Owsley Stanley was a governor of uh, Kentucky from 1915 to 1919. Was born May 21, 1867 in Shelbyville and lived in this house as a child, the son of Reverend. Well, he served six terms in US Congress and he was a US Senator 
So, you know, funny thing is the hippie movement, we all think it was a movement against the uh, against the elite, against the system, but in fact it was the system behind it, you know. The rich and the elite that were behind it and they sold us as something against the elite and a resistance and a, an uprising, an uprising against wars and all the war makers were behind it, you know. The whole thing is a scam. But it was good music though. Many of the 60s hippie recordings were made in Chateau Marmont in Los Angeles where Chateau it means castle and Mar from the pharaonic word Mer in Demotic for pyramid. So Marmont means in fact Pyramid Mountain. There you see that. This is in Los Angeles in America with the French name Chateau Marmont, which is, of course, again a, um, a reference to the nobility. And, you know, the entire European nobility, they, they, in the end, they come out of France. And before that, they were in Italy. That's why they speak French. So that's why it's Marmont. It's at Chateau, Chateau Marmont, a hotel in uh, California. And you can see it from Sunset Boulevard. And so a lot of recordings were made in this hotel. There's some funny symbols here on the it doesn't look like a sun hieroglyph, but it looks like the Vesica Pisces from here, the Vesica Pisces, you know, the two circles uh, with an oval in the middle. And, uh, okay, that's that's what it is. Yeah, that's the Vesica Pisces. Uh, the tower is octagonal, interesting. Nice hotel. So, you know, it's the elite behind the music, the, um, the nobility, pharaoh, etc. And the people, they just ran after the Pied Piper and after the skirts, after the, the laughter and the good music, etc. This is how they trap us in a movement. And in fact, the leading general on Napoleon's Egyptian campaign was Auguste Frédéric Vies de Marmont, who was a duke from Burgundy, France. So here's another tie between Pharaoh's worldwide nobility and the Laurel Canyon hippie music from the Pentagon. So here it says he was a duc de Raguse. And so there he is, and he was a, a marshal uh, under Napoleon, and you can see he's having the pharaonic sash, what all these aristocrats still do, and here a pentagon, a pentagon, like the Hotel Marmont, Chateau de Marmont in Los Angeles, and the pentagon behind the the hippie music of the 60s and this is in red for the red house the Pertasa of lower Egypt where they all come from well this is France there he is again in the younger years there he is uh, helping um, um, in the times of the French Revolution um, this lady is called Anne-Marie Hortense Perego. Maybe it was his wife. I don't know. Okay, there he is. That's uh, when he was in Egypt with Napoleon. Uh, Ulm. He was fighting everywhere for Napoleon here in Ulm in Germany. So he's one of the, those generals and marshals. 
So he's a f he's an important Republican figure for the new for the expansion of the new world order. Actually, um, this is the King of Spain. Uh, it looks like he's also for the uh, in favor of the White House here. <laughs> His name is Joseph, the King of Spain. Wow. It's all in white, so he's a Republican with a little bit of red. I mean, that's where they all come from, showing his origins. I mean, uh, <laughs> what what what's the use of this? You know, lifting up his skirt, showing the little bit of red. Oh, you know, showing his ass. That's where I come from. They do nothing without a reason. This is Wellington. Well, we also fought against. This this is Marshal Marmont again, the French Marshal fighting, being a general or Marshal of Napoleon. Nice horse. And this uh, Campagne de France looks like bloody Russia here. And uh, here another battle, and another battle somewhere, and another battle, another Arc de Triomphe. I think there are four. This looks like a prison here. A lot of fighting going on. This is the Duke of Reichstadt. I don't know what's he doing here. Look at Octagon here. Okay, this is the uh, the coat of arms of uh, the Duke of Marmont. You can see the uh, the cross of uh, Saint Omer, which I've shown you before, and this is the original coat of arms. Here's the concept of three. It's all in red and red and white for the Templars, the sword in it. And the concept of three is them, our masters. And of course this is a vertical roll. Which became the horizontal roll. Saint Omer was a Templar. So he was for the horizontal roll. And they come out of the vertical rule, the concept of three. And of course the Marshal de Marmont, he was a Republican, so he was part of the horizontal rule, but his origins are the vertical rule. Uh, this is something, what he, his own personal Marshal's flag and, and Marshal sticks, I don't know. Uh, this also has his uh, coat of arms in a later stage. It's, uh, and here's the original part of it. Looks a bit like America here. Swissy is here. Of course, that's their base. And this is what it finally became. Uh, nowadays, their coat of arms. Yeah. And here's the shell, like the petrol station, Fleur de Lis all over. Mm. The uh, the sticks of the marshal in it. And here in the middle is a circle, and this is a square, so it does say square and circle. So of course they weren't they are in favor of the um, of the republic. So they must be Freemason. Oh. Uh, here again, they're changing it a little bit over the time. This is his martial stick. Baton de Maréchal de France. Okay, people.
So the uh, the the hotel uh, on the, the Chateau de Marmont in Los Angeles, it's very much connected to Egypt. It's connected to to the nobility. Well, the name is French, so and uh, and to this duke, of course, it probably belongs to the uh, descendants of the duke. And this is a Chateau de Marmont in France. And um, of course there are more than one, there are several ones. Uh, it was mentioned the first time in 1272. So here lie the origins of the Chateau de Marmont in Los Angeles and where they did the recordings for the hippie music. In the 60s the most famous record company was Atlantic Records, harboring groups like the Beatles, Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Eric Clapton, Ray Charles, The Birds, etc. And Atlantic Records was founded by the Turk Ahmet Ertegun. So if I look at the logo, or one of their logos, this the oldest logo, you see here a cross, so there is a square, and the A is part of a circle, uh, so that stands for the compass. So it says square and compass. And there's two here, their logo, it has a meaning. I'll show that to you in a, big, a better picture. So here it is again, Atlantic in a bigger picture. So the whole thing is in a circle for the compass and there's a little circle here as well. There's a lot of sixes, but there are not three, there are four. So there are one, two, three, four of these things. We're in black, one, two, three, four, which is the concept of four. And the circle is the concept of three. So in here, only in here, it says square and compass. Now, what's a Muslim Turk doing in all this? Well, he belonged to the Young Turks, a fascist organization responsible for the Armenian genocide by the Turks, for the Turkish Sultan, and for, and also by, the Turkish nobility and done, or so the genocide was done in 1915, about which I made this short video here. Here you can see the young Armenian girls being crucified and the rest what they did to them. To them. Uh, it's, it's a real picture apparently. So here's the title and on my channel here. And uh, I didn't have much time to make this video because I was, you know, on the road. I had problems with my video editor. And, um, you know, the thing is, it's the same in Europe. You know, it's, it's the nobility doing these things. And the, the end of the, uh, the caliphate was in 1924 when there was another lesser genocide, I think in 1923 or something against the Armenians and um, so it's the same thing as in, in, in Russia the revolution you know there's a people's movement and uh, then and there are the Republicans and and there are the, the, the royalists you know? and the people start off a movement it gets infiltrated and um, by the uh, by the nobility and they do all the killing i mean the um, the communists they were a people's movement as i've been already telling you and yes there were a lot of jaywalkers in it but they were not fighting against the russian people but against the uh, nobility who were really parasiting on the people who, have, who were hungry and they got all killed all the jaywalkers got killed in 1934 by Stalin, the same, and then it, you know, it became a, something very bad. A good organization became bad, and the same thing happened with the Germans. 
And also in 1934, the Knight of the Long Knives, all the all the original German National Socialists, they got murdered and they got replaced by the nobility and they became the Nazis really. The Black Order of the SS and it became a force even against the German people. And in Turkey it was the same thing because the um, the Young Turks, they were a republican organization for the, out of the Knights Templars of course, for the um, the horizontal rule. But you know the um, the Republicans normally they have no they don't seek in like genociding any peoples like you know the only the only want the only thing they want is their at least in those days which is different maybe from now they wanted to get rid of the vertical rule of the Sultan which actually ended in 1924 so sort of a people's movement, the young Turks, there were even a lot of Armenians in it and Greeks, there were not so many Turks in it. And it got infiltrated by the nobility and uh, as they saw there were many Armenians who wanted a republic, they wanted to get rid of the, uh, the caliphate because the Armenians are no Muslims and they had to live under a, a Islamic caliphate by the Sultan. And um, so the nobility venged, they, they, they revenged on the Armenians because they started this organization actually, partly. And there were also Arabs in it, in the Young Turks. There were not so many Turks. And um, so uh, the, the genocide started, but it was done by the nobility. And of course Turks helped. You know, who believed in Pharaoh's uh, propaganda. The same thing in with the Russians or the, the, the Germans. The, of course the German people helped, but it was not it was not their idea. They were not the head of it all. They just believed all the lies and all the propaganda. It was very well done. And the same thing happened in uh, in Turkey. So so this guy, Ahmed Ertegun he was a young Turk, but uh, not the original young Turk, but uh, the nobility, the infiltrated young Turk. These things are very complicated people. It's, it's, the enemy is very smart. They infiltrate everything. They turn organizations around, you know, good organizations from the beginning. Uh, who become very dangerous, very lethal, very genocidal, etc. So we can speak of at least two or three sorts of young Turks here. It's the same with nationalists, and or, or people call them Nazis, but there are different types of Nazis, you know. Actually, there's only one type of Nazi. Um, in fact, but the way people use it, you know, the word Nazis, they use the word Nazi also for nationalists, and they are not Nazis. It's a, it's a, it's a different thing, and with the communists, it's the same thing. So this is very complicated. So, so well, go watch this video here. But I didn't have so much time, you know, I only did it in 11 minutes, but I, I could have taken two hours, you know, because the, uh, the subject is very complicated. So here's an article, the Young Turks and the Armenian Genocide. So the Young Turks were the perpetrators of the Armenian Genocide. But as I told you, it's more complicated than just that. Because, well, in the first place, the ones who got genocided, they were not there. They are not here anymore to tell the real story, what, what happened. And even if they could have done this, they wouldn't have known the real backgrounds uh, of their killers. And so the Young Turks, which started actually as, well, Republican organization, but it got all to taken over by the nobility. And of course it's all related to the Knights Templars, because the Young Turks, they wanted a horizontal rule, and, and the Templars, they are be behind it. 
but it got all taken over by the by the vertical rule uh, nobility and of course in Turkey it's the same thing they, you know they, uh, they also have the nobility just like in any other country so this Ahmet Ertegun of Atlantic records uh, he's nobility and that's why he can adjust so easily you know in in Western society you know as uh, for a normal Turk that wouldn't be so easy you know he would he would want his family he would want his religion and his origins his traditions and for the nobility as as he can mingle with the European nobility without any problem um, for Ahmed Ertegun of Atlantic Records there was no problem at all they even called him the last sultan the last sultan you know so here it says he created the Atlantic Records label in 1947 so here is Ahmed Ertegun oh, he doesn't look Turkish at all you know and he's got the same skull form like uh, Macron the French president very big here on top and getting quite narrow at the bottom um, I've, I've never seen a Turk and there are quite a lot of Turks here in Europe I've never seen a Turk like this uh, not only his face but what he radiates you know it, it's nah nobility Turkish nobility the last Sultan there he is Ahmet Ertegun or Ahmet Ertegun Ertegun was the co-founder and president of Atlantic Records there you go there he is, picture of him. There he is again. This is probably his father. He was a diplomat in Washington, D.C. So, you know, nobility. Atlantic Records. There he is again. This one here. <laughs> So, um, and here, this is what he said. Another guy, a mus musician, Serge Tankian, well, let's say Armenian name, has claimed that Ertegun was a pro proponent of pushing the myth that the Armenian genocide never happened. He said it never happened, claiming that he said so to avoid backlash in his home country of Turkey. Wow. I mean, a smart move, Mr. Ertegun. Of course, he, he denied the Armenian genocide because uh, apparently he belonged to the group, the Young Turks. The Atlantic Records Turks father was a diplomat in Washington DC and his assistant was Phil Spector. Here you see the family again. I showed that just before. And here it says in 1935 Ahmed and his family moved to Washington DC with his father Munir Ertegun who was appointed as the ambassador of the Republic of Turkey. So he was the ambassador, the ambassador's son. The ambassador of the Republic of Turkey to the United States. When Ahmed was 14, his mother bought him a record cutting machine, which he used to compose and add lyrics to instrumental records. And here, in November of the same year, 1944, uh, Munir Ertegun, so the ambassador, he died. And in 1946, President Harry Truman ordered the battleship, the USS Missouri, to return his body to Turkey as a demonstration of friendship between the US and Turkey. Well, see, this is, uh, this is the nobility, you know, amongst each other. They show this respect. 
I mean, how is it possible that, that a, a, a Islamic country like Turkey is in the uh, in the NATO? Well, this is only because the Turks are the slaves of their nobility. We are the slaves of our nobility, and just they just do whatever they want. You know, it's the lords who have an, a, a military alliance, and because these lords of Turkey, as you can see here. They are very much appreciated by the lords of the United States, so they take the ship, the USS Missouri, and bring his body back home. And this has nothing to do with with the Turkish people or the European people. The Young Turks are a killer organization under the control of the Templar Octogon. So that's why these Turks and Atlantic records could play a role in the Pentagon's hippie movement, social engineering. Musician Stephen Stills, his father William Stills, was in the military, and Stephen Stills attended the Admiral Farragut Military Academy in St. Petersburg, Florida, before going to Central America. So, Stephen Stills of Crosby Stills, Nezin Young. There he is. Of course, in an older age. Funny, they only, they only show the, the older pictures. Or the younger pictures, actually. Um, so, Stills was born in Dallas and raised in a military family again. He moved around as a child and developed an interest, etc. He was also, well, um, and he was spending his youth in Costa Rica, the Panama, the, the Panama Canal Zone, El Salvador. Stills attended the Admiral Farragut Academy in St. Petersburg. And he gradu graduated from Lincoln High School in Costa Rica. They're all military children, all of them. Of course, none of these famous 60s musicians got ever drafted into the Vietnam War and had to go into the army. While their fathers in the military industrial complex made sure they didn't have to. Hey. The music and cinema industry is a huge military psyop to steer the public through Pharaoh's social engineering. Therefore, so much military equipment in films like choppers, planes and tanks helped by the military industrial complex. Where else? Did they get the permission so easily for Hollywood to use the Pentagon's latest military ma material in all those Hollywood videos? Huh? Hell, I go in the army because I had such a good time in the film war movie with 60s music, identifying myself being a hero. Funny enough. Music has always been an integrated part of modern Republican armies in order to boost the morale and to divert from dying, making war a happy thing. All being part of the big lie of Pharaoh, who have analyzed our minds and feelings in this big scam. Just think of bagpipes, army brass bands, and army drummers. So it's really not that far fetched from bagpipes and army brass bands to the 60 musics, and that the Pentagon number 27 is behind the 60s music, also called Vietnam War music for a smooth dying process and lullaby for soldiers to go to sleep. The long sleep, that is. Just follow the number 27 Pied Piper either into death 
or into drugs. The military industrial complex is octagon of the Nazi Templars. So music and film industry is octagon of the Nazi Templars, where in their films their police always win and it's respected to go into the army the only way to become a real man in reality just fighting pharaoh's geostrategical wars for them you bleed and die while they fill up their pockets and get filthy rich therefore none of those filthy rich 60s musicians ever got drafted for Vietnam. You get it? Watch my film Warrior vs Soldier which you can see here and I'll send you the text if you want that. So here is uh, Warrior vs Soldier on my channel Hats of Hats. and here you can read I, read I wrote underneath Mothers raise your children as warriors so the pharaohs can't snatch them and make soldiers out of them. So I'm reading here a text what the difference is between a warrior and a soldier. I made this almost 10 years ago. The army is owned by the elite, by their state and by pharaoh's nobility who also own the media. The hippie music was entirely uplifted by the media, by big money and by record companies. The 60s PSYOP psychological operation to drown and choke the Vietnam War horrors with abundant glamour and happy tunes of hope while creating new drug addicts. Therefore, the reason of the Vietnam War, opium. The dr here, I read it for you. The drug used by American soldiers reached epidemic proportions in the late 1960s. The Department of Defense Survey, 1971. Marijuana, hash, 50% use, 14% every day. Heroin, 29% use. Psychedelics, uh, LSD and speed 39 percent use before 1968 marijuana use was largely ignored by the army widespread publicity led to a comprehensive program to eradicate its use yeah okay yeah arrest for marijuana possession reads as many as a thousand weekly so they had another means as well you know by uh, punishing the people. It was the attempt of the US military command to suppress the use of marijuana that caused to the switch to heroin as well as methamphetamines, barbiturates, psychedelics. By mid-1971 army medical officers were estimating that about 10 to 15 percent of the lower ranking enlisted men serving in Vietnam were heroin users. 10 to 15 percent were heroin users. You know, so first they try, they make people to ad addict to drugs. And then they say, oh yeah, no, we are clean. Uh, so, uh, the state, we don't want it. And we're going to punish them because it's not good, you know. While they are, are at the uh, at the source of it all, you know. And as a bonus, selling lots of music records for the elite. Anyway, music and its classical composers was always the monopoly of the elite and its aristocracy by Pharaoh. They did a pretty good job entertaining the sleeple through the 60s musical psyop by the Pentagon. And here you see the super rich Beatles with the symbol of the elite, the Rolls Royce in hippie colors. And of course the military uniforms because it was a 
psychological operation by the military industrial complex. Both the Pentagon and the, of course, also British military industrial complex. Well, anyway, the United States belongs to the British nobility. It still does. There were only a few men standing against it, like John F. Kennedy and the FBI's TDY, Thomas O'Loughlin, who were quickly terminated by these gangsters ruling over us, and who actually are getting very bold with their actual bug war and forced antidote poisons. And in fact, related to the actual situation today and the Wu flu, um, in the 19th century, in fact, it was Britain and its nobility again in the 19th century that led the drugs trade through Hong Kong and leading to two opium wars with the Chinese. When the Chinese saw how entire Chinese generations got hooked on opium, thus people getting hepatitis, liver problem, with many Chinese turning yellow because of the liver problems leading to the myth of the Chinese yellow race. So here it says the Opium War, so Emperor Dogun orders British shipments of opium be confiscated and destroyed. So the Chinese didn't want that drug trade by the, by the British Empire and they destroyed it. And during one seizure of British cargo, 20,000 chests of opium were destroyed. Each chest was worth $1,000. In 2007 dollars, that's about three, $300 million. So again, you know, China was attacked by the West, just as the Wu flu and um, and things going on today and um, so but of course the West what is the West that's the nobility and unfortunately the uh, well the stupid Europeans they always followed the uh, the nobility believe the nobility went into wars with for the nobility so the nobility could get filthy rich and the Europeans had to die for them. But the Chinese, they stood up against this. And um, so ever since there have been problems with the Chinese nobility and the European nobility. And that's probably also the reason why uh, the West uh, inserted the, uh, the Wu flu in, uh, in Wuhan, China. It is not Chinese people. You can see it all over history that China is the victim of European aggressors. Also, the Dutch Royal House and their cocaine factory in Amsterdam of the 20th uh, century traded tons of drugs all over the world and always the same powers behind it all. It here says the Royal Dutch Cocaine Factory it's a royal factory. In the first half of the 20th century, tens of thousands of kilos of cocaine were produced in Amsterdam. During the First World War, it was exported to soldiers on both sides of the front with full approval of the Dutch government. And it was a, a royal factory. So, you know, in related to the, uh, the hippie movement and the, uh, the Vietnam War, this has been going on for far, far much longer. And it's the royals behind it and the elite to whom the Pentagon belongs and the army, everything. Now I'll read it for you. Nowadays, it's hard to imagine, but over a century ago, Holland was one of the world's biggest producers of cocaine. Between 1900 and 1962, thousands of kilos of cocaine were produced and shipped to all parts of the world. 
officially the purpose of all that white powder was medicinal. But during World War I, the factory had permission from the government to traffic a fair show, a fair share to both Germany and England, who used it to provide soldiers on both sides of the front. How is that for commercial spirit? Cocaine is one of the most popular drugs in the world. Well, this is probably where the, where the Nazis got their cocaine from. You know. And it's all related to the 60 music, 60s music, you know, the, the, the hippie era, the Vietnam War. And it's said here they produced it until 1962, and that is exactly the time when, you know, the Vietnam War and everything. So then they they got all their, their drugs from somewhere else. It's 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 been going on for a very long time, all this, eh? and this nobility behind it. So this is very much related, and the the British Opium Wars to the. Um, so the hippie music era and the uh, the Vietnam War, it's all because it's all the same ones. And and I recently noticed when seeing some of the latest bug war protests in this cocaine producing monarchy in the flatlands, in the flat earth, that their royal police have a funny logo on their police cars with the O being lowered as to accentuate the circle as a reference to the compass and with a square on top of it thus saying square and compass for this worldwide royal freemason army against the humanity here the dutch badge to the right next to the german polizei with the Order of the Garter a white horse in it. So I suppose the Dutch equivalent for the word police is being pronounced as the German Polizei, only with a T in it, thus becoming Politei, which could also be the English pronunciation with tie in the end, like hanging us up with a tie. No? Well, tell me if I'm wrong, as I don't really know how to pronounce uh, this word. And of course, the polytai, or whatever the name is, do nothing against drugs, because Pharaoh's nobility is making a lot of money with drugs. So here you see, it's quite funny, you know, the O on the police cars, it, it is lowered as to accentuate the O in the circle for the compass with a square here on top of it. So it does say square and compass. And then this square has this funny thing in it. I don't know what it is. Is it a flame? But anyway, the flame has four parts for the concept of four. One, two, three, four. Which is us, actually. And it comes out of a circle, which is the concept of three, which is them. So... All what we are, you might say, we have learned, we have been taught by them. You know, the Germanic people couldn't even read nor write when these pharaohs came. So maybe that's why the concept of four, like coming out of this circle. So, but anyway, it does say here square and compass on all their police cars or their, all their polytai cars or whatever. The pronunciation of the word is. Of course, they also have another logo in that uh, cocaine-producing country. It says the uh, the Dutch police logo, and it is in a octagon here yeah, with a sort of eight things coming out of these of the circle here. No. Well, there it is. Okay. So this is the octagon, just like the English bobbies have on their heads. And you see it all over the world. All the police logos, they have the octagon. And here, eight things coming out of a 
what is it, a, a bottle or a circle. Well, anyway, here's also a circle. And it's in blue here for the war, the war crown. A war against humanity for this blue worldwide blue army. And here you can see it once more in Wikipedia. The National Police Corps with this Freemason logo here, yes, square and compass. Because they all take their orders from the Freemasons who come out of the military order of the Knights Templars. And this is also a military corps. It all comes out of the Knights Templars and who were, who belonged all to the nobility. So. And here, apparently, how it's being attached to the wall of one of their police stations in Flat Earth. The same square and compass logo here. And the interesting thing is, it has, of course, all in blue for the war crown. It has here as well a square for the concept of four. There are four corners in it. One, two, three, four. And there are three squares for the concept of three, which is, uh, so it says a double time, it says again, square and compass for the concept of four and the concept of three. So they're a bit overdoing it in that country, I suppose. And apparently in this very peculiar part of the world, they also have a special detachment in the police for this here. But I'm not, be, I'm not, allowed to pronounce and it says here together we hold the line and the line is blue oh, the police line and here it has the, this logo again here's the other logo what is this a sort of a no idea what it is and um, with the bug here Pharaoh's bug war well, what's funny why does it say in English it's quite funny because Apparently they they don't have English as a national language, do they not? Maybe someone can tell me if English is a national language there or a second language maybe. I didn't think it was. Some other US example of how Pharaoh's crime syndicate is attached to the US government and its corrupt Freemason authorities in a symbiotic relationship with the Mafia is the prohibition from 1920 to 1933 in order to get more money for a bottle of alcohol. So the corrupt Freemason government forbade alcohol to be sold. So Pharaoh's various crime syndicates could sell alcohol like 50 times the regular price, giving a lot of pocket money for Pharaoh's ever and ever more increasing descendants. And the alcohol smugglers got of course 100% protection from the corrupt US police who are just an aggressive private army of, by and for the elite. I read it for you. Prohibition made the mafia. Prohibition made the mafia. And the police and the authorities, they knew this very well. They knew this beforehand. Exactly the same as today with the drugs. And today with the bug war. And the, the medical dictatorship. The government is the Mafia. There's just a legal Mafia and this is the illegal Mafia, but they work together. And it all started because of the Knights Templars in Sicily. Oh. The US police only eliminated the competition when ordinary people started to sell moonshine and smuggle alcohol themselves. Exactly the same situation with today's drugs. History repeats itself, as usual. 
and says the war on alcohol, prohibition and the rise of the American state. So they use this as a pretext, the criminality, the crime around the alcohol, moonshine and, and you know, smuggling, etc. To, um, to have more money for the um, authorities. So this is how they used these government gangsters, they used the prohibition and the mafia which are their own man, you know, to to give pretext to the rise of the American state. You know, more money, we need more police, we need more Tommy guns. This is what they always do. In Germany, they use the same thing, like with the Bader Meinhof and the Rote Armee Fraktion, the RAF, German terrorists, you know, to have more police, to have more... Uh, Heckler und Koch machine, uh, submachine pistols, etc, etc, etc. They always do this. And now they use the same thing with the bug wars. More police, we need more, you know. So it's always the same. The same story presented in the 2018 US film White Boy Rick, based upon a true story where the FB lie has a 14 year old child by the name of Rick Wershey being set up to officially sell drugs for the FB lie who use a diabolical trap to have the child sell the FBI's drugs falsely promising the child that they would protect him and his dad. Therefore, the FBI, lie, as the boy got sentenced to life in a high security prison, so he couldn't speak about politicians like the mayor of Detroit being heavily implicated in the affair. The child did a 30 year stretch and had his life destroyed by believing and trusting the FBI. Lie. So here you see another example how the authorities are the real drug dealers and they work together with the Mafia. Uh, there's loads of examples of this, you know. Very good vid, very good film. Matthew McConaughey here plays very well and uh, Oh, there he was. Yeah, very great actor. Um, I liked the film because it was based upon a true story, so you know you can learn something, and uh, it fits in the narrative. You know, authorities are corrupt; they are the drug dealers. People, the only way to get rid of crime, drugs, pedophilia. Wars, corruption, murder and Satanism is to get rid of the police, to get rid of the politicians and their media and their judiciary. Abolish the police because they all work together with the mob where the mafia is just the illegal branch, branch of octagon. Whereas police and judiciary are the legal mobsters of Pharaoh's worldwide nobility and all their legal and illegal money scams to feed their considerably extensive pharaonic offspring. No justice, no peace, abolish the police. It's been enough now. Just get rid of these gangsters. Here you can see Ohio here, where there are many Swiss Americans. So the Swiss rule over the US, where the Swiss octagon is on all key positions in the US. And in some US states, this is more obvious than in others. 
like the state of Ohio, having one of the highest densities of Swiss Americans in the US, with in 2007 86,147 Swiss in Ohio, where in 2007 there were 11 million people altogether, of whom Swissy representing 1% of the Ohio population, which means that on every 100 persons there's one Swissy and usually going for all key positions like politics, judiciary and of course police. So when I saw the documentary 137 shots on Netflix about two unarmed black people getting chased by 62 police cars and shot dead with an overkill of 137 bullets by 120 cops in November 2012, which they even repeated two years later and again in November in 2014, also in Cleveland, Ohio, the police shooting dead a 12 year old black kid who was playing cops and robbers with a toy gun. I recognized the typical Swiss fingerprint over these police crimes and their judiciary backup in crime through the enormous amount of Swiss Americans in Cleveland, Ohio. I guess November is not a good time to go and visit Cleveland, according to the statistics. Afterwards, the killer cops got fully protected by the Cleveland Justice Department, by the media and by the politics, who all concluded a normal day in the office, so to speak. And then when I heard the killer cops acting as victims of it all, I recognized Swissy descendants here doing exactly the same things in Ohio, America, as they do in Switzerland, where it is totally normal when everyone agrees to kill unarmed people for no reason at all and lock the innocent up for many years in such an organized manner like a pack of wolves holding together for the final kill altogether with a total and shocking lack of conscience similar to the Nazis at the Nuremberg trials of 1945, the very same astounding cold behavior and the same play of perpetrators slipping into the victim's role, both saying, I don't remember, I had my orders. I didn't do it, etc. Same thing in Nuremberg, same thing the Swiss do, and the very same thing I saw happening in Ohio at the trials and how the whole thing got covered up. No wonder, because this is the very same bloodline. Nazis, Swiss American killer cops in Cleveland, and Swit Sar land, the land of Sar. What happened in Cleveland is happening every week in Switzerland of Swiss Nazi killer cops shooting down some immigrant and then being judged as a normal day at the office and that the Swiss cop had such a difficult line of work making victims out of the perpetrators. Swiss cops even crossed the border into France, where they shot an unarmed white French family man with wife and three months old son next to him in the car, with 18 bullets in his back. This is the European equivalent of 137 shots. 
18 shots in the back. So I made, I, I went and see the father because I'm quite disgusted by these sort of things and um, always perpetrated by the Swiss. And um, I interviewed the father and um, put the video, I made this video about it on my channel, Gatse Frats. Yeah. Then the three Swiss killer cops got acquitted in a French court twice, just as in Cleveland and in Switzerland. Swiss killer cops have license to kill, no matter where they are in the world, whether it be in France or in Cleveland and of course in Switzerland. And this was a real cinema film made about this affair and uh, it, the, the title is Mike. It's a film by Lars Blumers. I think it's a German um, it's a German film director. Uh, I think he also made Hollywood films and uh, the film is in English I think and in France, French. In Switzerland more than 10,000 asylum seekers have disappeared, which you can see in this video here on this channel. And they have death squads in Switzerland. I've seen them in action and they probably, most likely, um, have made these um, asylum, 10,000 asylum seekers uh, disappear. And this is 10 years ago, now, the, now it's probably 30,000 or something like this. All the slave ships to America belong to the Swiss, which you can see in this video here. And all the names of the, of the ship owners, the Swiss ship owners, you can find them in this video. And the KKK Ku Klux Klan is a Swiss organization with a Swiss flag in their logo, which you can see in this video here. You see, this is a Swiss cross and it's a Swiss flag, exactly the same. And there's also the square and compass in it. The circle stands for the compass, because with a compass you can make a circle. And this is a square. So all the initiated ones, you know, they see this immediately and in fact you know uh, in in the bottom grades of this organization you know they all think they're nationalists and and uh in favor for the white race and all that but uh in the end they don't even know that they the Ku Klux Klan is being ruled by a occult organization called the Freemasons who come out of the Knights Templars. So here's the title and you can find it in this channel here. Uh, this is a good Arab uh, who was living in Switzerland. He copied my video because otherwise you couldn't have seen it anymore as uh, YouTube deleted my entire channel with uh, 300 videos. And the Swiss, they pushed really hard, you know, to, to have this video disappear. Look, here it says, Fraternal Order of Police. And he knows exactly what it all means. So the police is an international crime syndicate who gets their orders from another crime organization called the Freemasons who come out of the Knights Templars from Switzerland, land, the land of Sar, their head office of organized crime in the Alps. Now look, it says the square and compass with the G, Police Masonic Fellowcraft Club, Ohio. The, the police is completely is full of Freemasons and um, so Templars then Freemasons 
and uh, who are everywhere in the police everywhere the police is full of Freemasons and all th and it comes out of a military order called the Knights Templars and who come out of Switzerland it says here police Masonic fellow craft it's like witchcraft you know, a craft okay? so if in order to understand the um, the killer cops in Cleveland Ohio and the 137 shots and gunning down it's a 12 year old kid if you don't understand the relation here police masonic fellow craft club ohio you will never understand it and if you don't understand where the masons come from that they come out of the knights templars you will not understand these murders and if you don't understand you know that the masons come out of the knights templars and that they come out of switzerland and Ohio has a 1% a Swiss Americans living there who all go for the key positions you will never understand these murders so you know you have to relate it all and know the history and you can find it in my videos and it says Ohio West Swissy murdered these innocent people it says the square and compass state highway patrol and here it says masonic trooper they are masonic troopers and they all think you know there are knights templars and they have a license to kill well they do have a license to kill you know you, you, you i mean remember that picture of trump standing in front of the uh, the, the police fraternal organization or whatever it said you know, it's it's and these are all premeditated murders. There was not even an accident. It's premeditated. Hundred thirty seven bullets, that's premeditated, you know. And uh look, it's all Freemason police. It belongs to the Freemasons here. Square and compass, Alabama Alabama trooper, Alaska, all square and compass. Each, each one of them has square and compass in it. Here. Yeah. Connecticut State Police, square and compass. Colorado, Colorado State Patrol, square and compass. Here. Yeah. Illinois, square and compass. Indiana State Police, square and compass. They all have it. And this is the square and compass. State of Hawaii. So. Yeah, Kansas patrols, uh, square and compass, here square and compass, Kentucky police, Louisiana state police, square and compass, it's, it's everywhere, each one of them. New Hampshire, squ square and compass, these are the ones behind the murder. And it all comes out of Switzerland, originally. So now you know who are the ones behind this murder. See, 137 bullets you know, through the wind, through the window here, murdering innocent, unarmed people, just like that. And this is happening in Switzerland, you know, every week. And um, altogether, there are one million Swiss Americans in the U.S., and they have taken over all key positions because Switzerland is the base of the Knights Templars and for that you know you must see all these videos like the Swiss Beast, Home of the Devil it will take you some time but you will understand what really happened in Cleveland, Ohio you can find the whole story here in, uh, in Wikipedia And here they shot down 12 year old kid in Cleveland, Ohio. What did I see there? Oh, a lot of occult looking statues there. Eh? Looks like a pharaoh there. And here, Lohmann, that's a typical Swiss name, eh? Lohmann. Very Swiss. I, saw, I heard that name in Switzerland. 
And this one too, Garmbeck. It's also Swiss German. And you know, the kids they can't even play with the toy gun anymore. They can't play cowboys and Indians. You know, they get shot by the police. But okay, they can have a um, like a, a gender bender operation. You know, no problem. Twelve years old, change your gender. You know, have an operation, no problem. But don't play with the toy gun. You know. Or they can have uh, pharaohs poison in their veins. Uh, that, that's okay for the uh, for the authorities, but don't play cowboys and Indians or something. Don't, don't be don't be a kid. You know you have to be an adult like when you're when you're twelve or when they're twelve and become a pink list killer. That's okay for the authorities and for the it's their agenda. Abolish the police. As you all know, the intel I give you here is unique and nowhere else to be found in the world. Neither in books, nor in films and documentaries. Therefore, I always tell you when the intel is not mine, as here in these videos here, saying that the intel is from your feedback and not mine. Although I've added a couple of things left and right. Here this video, your feedback on Dr. No. I got some intel from other people and I'll honestly say so. And here your feedback on Murky Christmas video. And on the same channel here. Yeah. I do so because I believe in certain values. I believe in the three H's. Honesty, honor, and humbleness. Therefore, I have to admit to you that the information about the fathers of the US 60s hippie musicians, all having very high ranks in the military and intelligence, is not mine. Although I've added a lot and made a lot of connections to the Knights Templars and to Switzerland and the Pharaohs. A French Armenian once gave me an internet text of a book about this all, which I read last year because I didn't have any internet for about half a year. So I don't even know who wrote that book. But he did an excellent job, and too important not to tell you. And as it fitted the narrative of this video, I took the liberty to use this good man's intel, for which I can't take credit, because I believe in honor, honesty, and humbleness. The three H's. Here it says, the 3H Crusade, bring back honesty, honor, and humility. Well, I say humbleness, I explain you why. Because humility, it sounds like you humiliate. So humbleness is the word I use. So the 3H Crusade, honesty, honor, humbleness. I despise all these scam artists and plagiarists who steal from others without even mentioning them and take all the credit and even money for it. You probably know lots of examples on YouTube. This is the way I'll die, having the three H's in my luggage. Hey, Swissy. This you couldn't take away from me. You have taken away the rest. But not this, was he. I know the official word is not humbleness, but humility. But as humility is phonetically too close related to be humiliated, I prefer to use my own set of words saying humbleness. As humility sounds like humiliate, and humbleness doesn't. Humiliate sounds somewhat effeminate, while 
humbleness sounds closer to the essence of what I'm trying to define and transmit. The system needs to be beaten anyway. Hey, Swissy.